Borada, Achrisel, Ibaub, and thank you very much for joining us for what we anticipate will be a, a really interesting and we hope rewarding day for you all. Whether you're able to join us in the room or you're joining us online, we're, we're really pleased that you have felt that you want to participate in this event. Uh, my name's Steve Martin. I'm the director of the Wales Centre for Public Policy, which is hosting today. Um, I take no credit or indeed blame for what happens. Uh, all of that goes to, to my colleagues Jack and Helen have orchestrated the day. Um, deep thanks to them and to other colleagues from the centre who are helping. Uh, you can identify us via these attractive teal badges. If you need anything at any point in the day, just grab one of us and we'll do our very best to help. Um, Jack and Helen have called us together today um, for this really important discussion about how Wales will need to look different in the future. They've said by 2050, I know that there are those of you in the room who think it's much more urgent than that and we should be talking about 2025, 2030, 2035, but leave that aside. How, how do we need to change here in Wales? And this is an opportunity for us to share with you some of the key findings of the work that we've been doing around decarbonisation, climate change mitigation, net zero, over the last 18 months to two years. But also, really importantly, to put experts in touch with each other for a dialogue around a range of different elements of that important climate change challenge that we face. And what we're hoping to do today is by the end to be able to draw out some thinking about the longer term strategic challenges which we as a, a nation face and we as individuals and households need to respond to. So I hope that's what you feel that you've signed up for today. If it isn't, um, you have to make a discreet exit in a minute. Speaking of which, uh, a couple of housekeeping announcements. As far as we know, there's no fire drill planned, so if the fire alarm goes off, it probably is for real. Please don't panic. Uh, we believe that the fire exit is at the back of the, the room there, and then make your way outside to the car park. Again, my calm and accomplished colleagues will escort us in the event of anything like that. I, I don't believe there will be. So, quick outline of the day. This first session will set the scene for you. Helen will talk a little bit about the work of our centre, and Jack will then home in on our work around decarb. Uh, and Rianan's going to set the scene in terms of the policy landscape and the future, well, well-being of future generations legislation, and, and the links between that and the subjects that we'll be talking about today. There'll then be a couple of parallel sessions, one on energy networks and another on net zero skills. And then after lunch, we're back in here for a plenary on growth, degrowth, and a circular economy before two more parallel sessions. We'll explain to you where to go for those when the time comes. Um, and then finishing with a keynote from uh, Dr. Owen Williams, who we're, we're really delighted to welcome, already here, uh, chaired by my colleague, Rachel Ashworth, who I think is also here somewhere, Dean of the Business School. So that, that's more than enough for me. I'll just introduce our speakers. Helen Tilley is Senior Research Fellow in the Wales Centre for Public Policy and leads our programme of work on the economy, decarbonisation and skills. Jack works very closely with her on that and a number of other projects. And Rhiannon Hardiman um, is a change maker in the Future Generations Commissioner's Office um, and has been doing a lot of work around the whole subject that we'll be looking at today. I'll hand over to Helen. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and great to see you all here. I'd like to say a few words about who we are and what we do. Um, we are funded by the Welsh Government, the Economic and Social Research Council and Cardiff University, and we support the Welsh Government and public services to access, understand, and, and apply evidence to improve policy making and delivery. So we sit in the space between evidence and decision makers. And to do this, we follow a demand-led approach. We take on direct commissions from the Welsh Government and other bodies and identify key areas 
of interest for the wider public service. And through our affiliations, we're a strong voice for Wales through the What Works network as well. The diagram on the next slide shows how we understand our role and how we can help policymakers access evidence. We bring together evidence and expertise to address key policy issues across the devolution settlement and communicate our work to the policy communi community and also advocate not for issues but advocate for the use of evidence. We've got also got a research programme and this aims to increase our understanding of how evidence is accessed and used by policymakers. And on the next slide, it shows that we address policy issues across all areas of devolved policy, but we situate our work within six main programmes, which helps to provide us focus. And our decarbonisation work sits mainly within the economy decarbonisation and skills programme. And all of our work's available on the website, so please do take a look. And we'll be talking today about some projects that haven't yet been published as well, so it's a little bit of a heads up into what is forthcoming. I'll hand you over to Jack now. Okay, thanks Helen. Uh, the next slide shows our current and recent work on decarbonisation, covering a number of different aspects of it, but with a clear focus on the implications of net zero for Wales as a whole. Our work on just transitions highlights how decarbonisation might result in new inequalities or exacerbate existing ones and how using a just, transition, a just transition framework might allow for alternative approaches that remediate inequalities. More recently, we've looked at how this idea has been received and applied elsewhere in the world and what the lessons might be for Wales. Likewise, our work on skills highlights the challenges that Wales faces across a range of industries and sectors but also the opportunities for retraining and redeployment and attracting a broader, more diverse workforce into Welsh industry. We've recently published our work on carbon modelling in the housing sector, which looks at how new modelling approaches might help policymakers understand the best routes forward for decarbonising housing. We've also recently been invited to support the Wales Net Zero 2035 group, chaired by Jane Davidson, which looks at areas where decarbonisation could be advanced more rapidly. This is an ongoing project and we're pleased to welcome Jane to chair our after lunch session today where she will say a little bit more about the group. But our focus today is our work on decarbonisation in the Welsh economy. This project seeks to take a longer term view of decarbonisation, asking whether and how we want Wales' economy, culture and society to change with decarbonisation and what different routes and balances there are to achieving net zero. Net zero is not just about cutting emissions, but also reflecting the values which the people of Wales want to uphold. We want to understand the different routes that are available and what they mean for the lives of people in Wales, and now and for future generations. Likewise, we want to open the space of this debate so that whichever pathway is chosen is chosen democratically in a way that reflects rather than rejects the wishes of the Welsh people. On to the next slide, please. So what we're hoping to do today is to reflect the differing points of view on a range of key questions for Wales's future. How do we ensure an energy network which is fit for our future energy needs? How can we adapt our skills system to prepare for the transition ahead? Is economic growth and technological development the way to net zero, or is a post-growth economy needed? How can we balance Wales's agricultural communities with the need for afforestation, carbon storage and increasing biodiversity? And how can modelling contribute to successful policy making? We will lay out the evidence we've accumulated and share our experts' perspectives on these questions, but what we want to highlight beyond this is the need to have these discussions and reflect on how different political choices will lead to different policy pathways, and that our vision of the Wales that we want will determine how we act now. So if there's one thing we want to emphasise over today and would like you to take home with you, uh, it's this. Long-term thinking and open debate helps to get us there, but also, we think, means more effective, joined-up policy. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the day, and I'll hand over now to Rhiannon. Good morning. As mentioned, my name is Rhiannon, and I'm a changemaker with the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. I've been asked this morning just to do a little bit of scene setting and hopefully to leave you feeling inspired for the day ahead. So we're talking today about decarbonisation of the economy. 
So I'm going to start with the climate emergency. Now, it's very easy to label that as an environmental issue, which requires an equally environmental response. But the truth is that so many of the things that we do day to day and all the decisions that we're making in our lives and our work, all of those things are wrapped up in that response to the climate emergency as well. The climate emergency is linked to the cost of living crisis, for example, which I'm sure many of us are feeling the pinch of that. It's also linked to the energy crisis. And by that, I mean escalating costs of household energy, um, with, coupled with some of the most energy inefficient housing in Europe. The climate emergency is also a health emergency. The World Health Organization estimates that climate change will lead to around 250,000 extra deaths per year globally from 2030. It's something which impacts on basic human rights, housing, food, equality of opportunity, finding good paid work, and increasingly it's having an impact on our mental health through anxiety, insecurity for the future. All of these sorts of things you might recognize as the wider determinants of health. But perhaps we could flip this for a second. What this means is that addressing the climate emergency can actually have multiple win-win solutions working towards net zero can have multiple benefits. But it calls for collaboration and understanding that it's a shared endeavor that we're all making. And it also calls for a shared vision of where we are heading and why. So a couple of examples of what I mean here. Investing in retrofit work to reduce household carbon emissions has the power to take people out of fuel poverty it can keep people out of hospital in winter. And at the same time, it's creating good, skilled jobs in a new green industry, enabling people to travel actively um, and to connect with everything they need within a, a walk or cycle from where they live. It will significantly reduce transport emissions, but actually it's also going some way towards tackling the obesity epidemic, giving us cleaner air, and also creating thriving local communities and local economies. Now a whole raft of policy areas are full of these connections and these are key to achieving the well-being of our people and our planet. In Wales, we've placed these connections into law. So a groundbreaking piece of legislation called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. It requires public bodies to work towards and maximize seven national well-being goals now, it's not about cherry picking which goals, a healthier Wales, a prosperous Wales. It's about actually looking across them all to make sure that they all benefit and there is no detriment to one goal compared to another. It's founded on the sustainable development principle of meeting our needs today without harming the opportunity for future generations to also be able to meet their own needs. Now, this is a principle which must underpin any decision that we make as public bodies. The Act also created the world's first independent Future Generations Commissioner, Sophie Howe, to support and advise public bodies along their journey. So what do we mean by well-being? Well, under the Act, there are four dimensions of well-being. There's social, cultural, environmental, and economic well-being. And the Act gives us permission, ambition, legal obligation, however you want to look at it, but towards working to improve all of those four dimensions of well-being in tandem. So how do we do this? Well, the key to the implementation of the Act, whenever we're coming up with a new approach, a new strategy, a plan, we need to be working in five particular ways. Now, the first of those is involvement. Now, this way of working stresses the importance of involving people who have an interest in achieving those well-being goals and ensuring that those people reflect the diversity of the area as well. So, in other words, is everyone affected actually being heard? The second way of working is integration. And this way of working tells us to consider how a public body's well-being objectives actually might impact across the well-being goals or how it might impact another public body's well-being objectives, for example. This is around the idea of making the connections across different policy areas. The third way of working is collaboration. 
And this way of working encourages us to work better with people, to work with communities, to work better with people in different parts of our own organizations even. Where can you work together to achieve those sorts of mutual wins? Then the fourth way of working is prevention. And this calls on us to act in a way which prevents problems, poverty, inequality, climate change, whatever those are, preventing them from occurring in the first place or preventing them from getting worse. And then the fifth way of working is long-term thinking. Here we see the importance of balancing short-term needs against the, um, the ability to also meet longer-term needs. Also that sustainable development principle that I mentioned earlier. Now long-term thinking can actually prove to be the most challenging when we find ourselves in an environment where we're always firefighting and there are multiple crises that we're trying to tackle. So the Act is unique to Wales and it offers a huge opportunity to make a, a long lasting positive impact. Since it was passed in 2015, the Act has helped to make sure that decisions taken today create a better tomorrow. And there are many examples of where the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is changing policy and it's leading to positive changes on the ground. And there are many people and organizations from across sectors and across Wales who are all part of this movement. So what are some of those positive changes? Well, the Act has helped create a 10-year national strategy for healthcare, which focuses on preventative measures and a long-term vision of keeping people well, not just about treating illness. How we keep people well is intrinsically linked to our environment, our economy, and our culture. How the Act is influencing transport in Wales. Money's being invested into sustainable travel, and Wales is leading the way, moving away from carbon-heavy transport options to prioritizing low-carbon active travel. Recycling. Wales is already topping charts with the third highest recycling rate in the world and a target for zero waste by 2050. Some inspiring work is already happening in this space across Wales, repair cafes, libraries of things, a road being resurfaced with four tons of nappies. And then education. Wales has now adopted a purpose-driven curriculum with the Wellbeing Act at its core. The new curriculum puts an emphasis on mental health, eco-literacy, developing well-rounded, ethically informed young people who are ready for the future. So this is just a flavour of how the Act is transforming our ways of working and our ways of living in Wales. And these small pockets of good practice across the country could become the new business as usual. So to finish, I'd like to share with you a video that we've produced recently. And it does far more justice to those examples that I just shared than anything I could say. So this is how people in Wales are taking action, and I hope you find them inspiring. Thank you.
Thank you, Helen, Jack, Rhiannon, for getting us off to a great start and setting the scene for today. We're very aware that we haven't allowed time in this session for questions and discussions, having said that the whole purpose of today is dialogue and discussion, but there'll be lots of opportunities through the rest of, of this conference. Um, we've got two or three minutes now to move to the room, if you're moving to the room on um, net zero skills. Uh, if you're interested in energy networks, the good news for you is you can stay in this room. So we're going to break into our parallel sessions. The, yeah, is it? Sorry, ignore that. Net zero skills in here. Energy networks on the first floor. Turn right and go up the stairs, and there are people on hand to direct you. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Hello. My name is Dan Bristow. I'm the Director of Policy and Practice at the Wales Centre for Public Policy, and I'm going to be uh, chairing this session this morning on net zero skills. So, um, as, we were, as we've already heard this morning, the transition to net zero requires large-scale structural change in the Welsh economy. New industries and employers will be needed to reflect the shifting patterns of demand for new services and products, and existing industries from manufacturing to agriculture will need to change to reflect these shifting patterns of demand. And this will evolve the need for different types of uh, service and, and different types of products and the skills associated with those to, do, to create those things. These will evolve rapidly uh, and at scale um, over the period of time that we're talking about out to 2050. The most comprehensive work to look at pathways to net zero from the Climate Change Committee, the kind of changes that they uh, describe in trying to map this pathway to net zero are huge uh, and require fundamental changes in, in the, the structure of the Welsh economy, but society more generally. And that will have huge implications for the world of work and the skills that people need in order to participate in the world of work. In Wales, and then in the context of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, as we were just hearing from, from Rhiannon, we, there's a need to think about that transition um, uh, and about how to manage that transition in a, in a way that is just. This session is going to be looking specifically at the skills aspect of that transition. And can we say what kinds of skills are needed now and in the future, given the uncertainties about about that transition and the pathway to net zero? And how can government, business, and unions work together to support people to develop the skills necessary uh, and to avoid what might otherwise be an unjust transition with consequences for individuals and communities across Wales? So the way that we're gonna structure this, we've got a presentation from my colleague, Helen, who spoke at the, at the, the session just now. Um, and then we've got responses from, uh, from our panel members. And then there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers from, uh, from you guys, from the floor. So I'm really pleased to uh, welcome to the panel discussion this morning, Shivana Taj, who's the General Secretary of the Wales TUC, Brett John, who's the Deputy Head of Policy at the Federation for Small Businesses, and Emma Edworthy, who's the Deputy Director for Employability and Skills at the Welsh Government. So I'm gonna hand over to Helen in a minute, and then we will have responses from our panel members, and then we'll have a Q&A discussion to follow on from that. Thanks very much. I'm gonna hand over to Helen now. Right. I'd like to talk for a few minutes to tell you a little, about, a little bit about our background um, work that we've done in this area. Um, the, I'll talk through three, three things, um, and our work's very much a contribution to an ongoing conversation, so um, we're drawing on the latest evidence that is available, but of course in this area it is rapidly evolving. I'm going to talk through um, the first two projects. Um, I'll also briefly mention lifelong learning as it's very relevant to the area. So firstly, skills for a just transition. The next slide indicates how um, I've broadly outlined the main areas of our work and it builds on our previous economy and skills and just transition pro projects. And we noticed that there was an evidence gap, um, particularly in the area of reskilling and decarbonisation. So this was a think piece that we put together rather than a directly commissioned piece of work. And we looked at, firstly, what's the problem? What types of skills are needed for the decarbonised economy? And what are the high-risk areas and also the potential growth areas for those skills? Secondly, we looked at the lessons, what type of interventions have been undertaken in Wales that could be adjusted or expanded, and also what in interventions have been undertaken elsewhere 
that could be applied to Wales. Thirdly, we considered the institutions that could be involved and what is the role of local and regional bodies in identifying and providing support for the transition of skills to decar in decarbonised industries, particularly looking at high-risk areas. And how might the private sector, the education sector, government bodies, public sector work together to support the future green labour market? The next slide shows the case studies um, that we drew on several international contexts, Australia, Germany, Netherlands, Singapore, and the United States, and also we looked at Scotland. And the discussion highlights in the paper three areas of structural adjustment policies that we use to manage industrial transition. So firstly, skills development, fostering business partnerships, and also worker and community support. I, on the next slide, wanted to highlight a few things from the Welsh context. Um, just to really stress how Wales is different, of course, as you're all aware. Um, Wales has 80 to 85 per cent of the, relative, of the productivity compared to UK as a whole. And although there's traditionally a high manufacturing base in Wales, it's actually the skills composition within the industries that accounts for this. There's also few international headquarters in Wales and a high proportion of small and medium-sized enterprises as well. In terms of the skill base in Wales, 66% of adults are underskilled to some extent, so there's a great scope for improvement. 4.4% of adults participate in further education, adult community learning. So that's a start, but also scope for that to be built upon. And 13.6% of adults have got poor essential skills. Our findings... We concluded that, and then this is, this is also a finding with which you're all, all familiar, it's well known that there's no clear, straightforward definition of green jobs. And it's not just about new jobs, it's about the development of skills within existing roles that are already present. There's, so of course, the direct effects of reskilling for the net zero transition, but also a lot of indirect effects that need to be dealt with and accounted for. And it's essential to redistribute economic benefits to ensure that there's a just transition. And in fact, the transition really can't be achieved without redistribution. And there are risks of skill shortages if there isn't a redistribution, which will actually entrench existing inequalities. And there's been a lot of work within Cardiff University on this. In terms of lessons, we found that policy responses should target three areas from the case studies. Skills development, firstly, fostering business support, and the worker, worker and community support. In terms of the approach, we found that successful approaches have got three broad characteristics. Firstly, they're strategically planned and look towards the longer term. They focus on localized and individualized delivery and they involve a collaborative approach. So a number of those things we've just heard about in the um, presentation from Rhiannon this morning. So it's a really op important opportunity in a net zero transition to plan in advance and strategically. And it's really important also to have cl clarity on the high risk areas and the skills profiles of those and to involve communities in the transition directly. And then on the next slide, we show how the approaches to the transition can be applied to Wales. We looked at three areas, industry, education, and government, and local and regional bodies. And really, this slide highlights the importance of them working together. For industry, it's important for industry to access current skills and identify future skills needs. And for this, to identify training opportunities and make them targeted and research and innovation, and also to increase the demand for high-skilled labor through investment in research and innovation. For education, promotion of lifelong learning, which I'll come to in a moment, and also increasing the access to and demand for retraining and skills in order to respond to the needs within industry and business. And government and local and regional bodies there's a lot more that can be done in terms of accessing and using labour market information and data to inform the strategy 
and provided targeted, in, targeted interventions to support workers and strengthen communities and regions as well that will be more affected. Net zero skills. The next slide um, highlights our key, key questions for this research. And we were asked to support the Welsh Government's forthcoming Net Zero Skills Action Plan, which Emma will talk about. Um, and this provides a rapid, our work provides a rapid overview of the evidence of future skills needs across the emissions sectors and also across <coughs> cutting themes in Wales. We conducted interviews with sector representatives and also undertook a brief desk-based review of evidence for the eight emissions sectors. And our key questions, as shown on the slide, to what extent is it, is no, is it known what future skills will be needed across the different sectors in Wales? So what are the knowledge gaps? To what extent are those skills needs being met? And are they expected to be met in the future? And then finally, what support can be provided to help businesses meet those skills needs? The recommendations, I'll talk about these in terms of sectors briefly, although there's a lot more to say in the report, um, which is forthcoming, and also a little bit about the cross-cutting areas. Um, there's a lot to be said about, and our report contains a lot of information on the specific technical needs within the emissions sectors. Um, but it's also, as well as the technical new skills that are needed, it's also about skills across all areas, including project management, um, managerial skills, carbon accounting, and literacy. And incentives to retrain will be needed just to present, prevent existing workers leaving the market, as we've seen during COVID and taking early retirement, for instance, to really be able to make the most of the skills that are already present that can be adjusted um, as needed for the transition. And signposting government and bodies, such as Business Wales, will be important to help businesses access the support. Cross-cutting recommendations, having a just transition framework to underpin this, the efforts that are put in place will be critical and to address the need to reskill and redeploy workers. And also maximizing the diversity of new entrants will be important and being able to talk to a framework for this will be critical. The Welsh Government is also doing some work in this area at the moment. Um, and education and skills system re reform is key. Again, are being underpinned by data and long-term planning and labour market intelligence, and coordination and collaboration as well was a key theme that came out here. Digitalisation is critical, and also circular economy and supporting businesses to make those changes. And the Welsh language was also a key aspect, and sensitivity to for businesses to respond to and to be able to provide Welsh language in key areas is important. I'll finally just say a few words on lifelong learning because this is relevant even though it's not directly um, talking to this area. We were asked to talk, um, to, to, sorry, excuse me, to do a review of lifelong learning um, in 2020, which is to support the implementation of the new Commission for Tertiary Education and Research and the introduction of the new Tertiary Education and Research Bill by the Senate. And this is really a key part of the net zero transition. And I here wanted to highlight the importance of lifelong learning in retraining and skill development and acquisition. And this slide highlights that it's very much about creating a culture for skill development as an ongoing process during someone's lifetime. And as part of this, we explored the enabling environment for it and where informal and formal learning actually support one another and the changes that are needed and some of the barriers that can be um, removed to help people access and to continually update their skills. So finally, on the last slide, just to point you in the direction of where you can find out more about our work in this, uh, on these projects and other work in this area. Um, and the Net Zero Skills report is due to be published in early February, so that's not yet online at the moment, but it will be shortly. And thanks very much for listening.
Um, so, what, what is it that I'm going to talk about in relation to Net Zero? First of all, um, just to say, um, we really welcome the publication of the report. Um, there's probably nothing in there that we would disagree with. Um, and I think that the, the report specifically in relation to developing skills for a just transition and having that real clear focus, um, particularly as has just been mentioned in relation to lifelong learning, is really important. Um, and I'm, we're pleased that the report specifically talks about and, and very clearly references the importance of worker voice and collaboration and co-production because we do genuinely need to ensure that workers, especially those who are going to be working in carbon heavy industries, have that bright future um, and that we have an economy that does work for all for every single person in Wales, but also that Wales remains attractive and is attractive for people who want to come to live and work in Wales. Um, and I think that I was also really struck by the references as far as the, the, uh, the difference between the German and the Welsh experience in particular. Um, so in the Ruhr Valley in Germany, unions and workers played um, a full part. They worked collaboratively, they did that co-production, and they produced a very clear plan um, to support miners into new jobs through skills training specifically. And as a result, um, and the report references this, workers received qualifications through training and on-the-job certification that was provided by the coal and steel companies. Now, if you look back to the 1980s, and what happened here in Wales um, and what happened to Welsh mining um, communities and, and the valleys, that situation was very different to what happened in Germany. And many of those communities continue to suffer as a result of what happened at that time. The, earlier on in the, in the first part of the session, uh, we had um, uh, the representative from the Future Generations Commissioner Commissioner's Office, and she was talking about, you know, the need to build a, a brighter future. Well, for the many of the individuals that were and still do feel left behind, that intergenerational kind of trauma almost that gets passed on from industry disappearing, the impact on the community, that has long-lasting impact. And again, it was referenced in terms of the, uh, the mental health and well-being aspect and the impact of all of that and not knowing what the future looks like. Um, is very, very clear, and we're seeing that on a daily basis. We're seeing that as far as the social and economic um, differences that remain uh, for particular um, communities in Wales. So it's now really important that um, unions have a very clear role to play um, in Wales's skills future. Now, I know many of you are, are, are probably maybe some of you in this room are members of a, a trade union, so understand when I talk about unions. But nonetheless, unions have been in the news over, mm, for a long time now, it feels. Uh, for many, many months, uh, we had the, uh, what we referenced as the summer of solidarity of, of strikes and waves of strikes. We're seeing a continuation of disputes at the moment in relation to the cost of living crisis and many workers feeling that they have been left behind that um, in certain areas where, in the private sector, for example, it is commercial interests that are being put um, in front of the interests of workers. And then we're seeing, of course, the impact as far as the public sector is concerned as well, where pay has been held back for over a decade. But I don't want you to think or ever believe that all unions do is go on strike. Going on strike is a last resort. Um, more often than not, we're actually sat in a room with employers, with government, particularly here in Wales, where we work in social partnership to find ways and means of creating that brighter future for workers um, in Wales, both those that are currently in work, um, but also those that are currently seeking alternative uh, careers or entering into the jobs market for the first time. <laughs> So I agree there's lots of real opportunities as far as uh, practical steps are concerned um, in establishing that, uh, as I say, the, the Social Partnership Council, as I've said, that really is about strengthening something that what we reference quite often as the, the Welsh way of working. And I think COVID, again, was an opportunity for us to start thinking that through 
um, a little bit uh, better. And um, we worked very closely with um, employer business organizations as unions, with local government, with third sector organizations and so forth to find ways forward collectively. Now, I think we need to have the very same approach when it comes to um, what a green future looks like for Wales and how do we decarbonize safely so that nobody is left behind. So I think that the, um, as far as our strategic role is concerned, we also, as the Wales TUC, published a report called Negotiating Net Zero. And the idea behind this report was really to provide um, some really helpful examples of where some of this stuff had already happened. So, for example, the energy giant SSC announced its own transition plan, and that included funding for reskilling workers and work participation, specifically in relation to decision making. Unions weren't cons initially consulted as far as that design of the plan works was concerned, but they were definitely engaged as far as the implementation is concerned. But for all of this to happen, we've got to see, you know, private and public investment um, that's going to be needed to support decarbonisation. And we also, of course, then we've got to invest genuinely in training, but also in infrastructure. And in our report, um, A Green Recovery and a Just Transition, we recommended 16 infrastructure projects that totaled $6 billion in public investment that could actually create 59,000 jobs in Wales alone in the next two years. And, you know, the, the report talked about the, um, the, a range of different economic benefits, and that's why we've also now been supporting bids from Holyhead um, and ports in southwest Wales for the UK government in particular to develop their capacity to support the installation of, of offshore wind farms, for example. And likewise, uh, we've been supporting Rachel Reeves' plans to spend 28 billion a year on tackling climate crisis. But when we talk about the creation of these jobs, they do have to be fair, you know, they, they do have to be well-paid jobs, they do have to be unionized jobs, um, and we need to be making sure that these sorts of schemes that are then introduced as well, that women, and workers from black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds are also then well represented in the workforce. Um, and I think there's, there's some research that's going to be coming from Cardiff University on mainstreaming quality and net zero. I think, again, that's going to be an opportunity really for us to think that through um, about creating that uh, new economy opportunity um, and, and really looking at some of the inequity that currently exists and to make sure that we don't go backwards in time and we don't repeat those same mistakes that we've done. We've also um, been doing some really positive work um, as far as net zero is concerned already, as far as green skills demands are concerned. Uh, we have been using our network of union learning reps um, on the, uh, as part of the Wales Union Learning Fund as well. And a great example of this, um, and I'll end here, was in relation to Swansea Council. So Swansea Council currently has 60 electric vehicles in its fleet. A further two to 300 are going to be introduced in the next few years. Now, where electric work, uh, vehicles were first introduced into the fleet, maintenance was actually being subcontracted out. But the pandemic revealed that actually this wasn't a resilient strategy. It, it, you know, it was gonna be very, very costly. So the fleet manager of the central transport unit at Swansea Council uh, realized that there was a problem. He then uh, worked with the union to find a way of using the Welsh Union Learning Fund so that we could actually train existing staff so they could actually maintain those vehicles. Now, other councils are also following through and looking to see, well, there's a really good example here, you know, how do we actually now move forward in a very practical way? So this is for me, it's really about finding practical solutions, making sure that we have a resilient strategy, and if something doesn't work, or actually doesn't feel right, that we question it. And I think it's really important for us to have events like this, where we can question each other's opinions and have that debate, um, and um, because I don't want a situation where certain individuals, certain communities, feel that they didn't have a voice in the decisions that were taken. You know, we're very, very clear um, in Wales about the, you know, our future. 
what, you know, where we uh, want to go. Um, and workers have got to be um, at the heart of those decisions because they do genuinely understand their industries and they know what um, opportunities exist as well. Thank you. Good morning, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to contribute to today's session. The consequences of not acting on climate change are well documented, well understood, and meeting this challenge will require the efforts of every part of society, including small businesses. So I'm grateful to be able to voice some of their ambitions and some of the challenges that they face today. Skills is a vitally important area, and now is an important time to ensure that our aspirations on net zero are underpinned and rooted with a solid grasp of the issues that face our small businesses. But I want to kick off with some numbers, first of all, demonstrating why they matter. We hear all the time that small businesses are the backbone of our economy or the, they're the heart of our communities but they account for 62% of private sector employment, 41% of turnover, and over 99% of total enterprises in Wales are micro, small, or medium-sized. So before we delve into some of the possible solutions, I'd like to further develop the scale of the challenge that small businesses face today and some of the difficulties in engaging with the net zero skills agenda. Some of the issues are long-standing and well-established owing to a business's uh, composition or size, but small businesses, particularly those at the micro end of the spectrum, are typically only a handful of people who are having to wear many different hats and perform many different duties uh, in absence of well-resourced departments that can dedicate their energy and their focus on areas like recruitment and upskilling their team. And within that context, developing uh, robust and ambitious training plans to grow and to gr green their business can be hugely challenging. The mundane, the routine, or simply the necessity to firefight through the week can often be uh, a, a distraction from more strategic activities. Some of the challenges are in formalizing these sentiments. Our research suggests that uh, only a third of businesses have a formal training plan and only a fifth have a budget dedicated to training. Each quarter we ask our membership what's the biggest barrier to growth and typically around 31% choose the skills shortage as the biggest barrier. Now that may not seem like a lot but within the context of utility costs spiraling, a time of unprecedented challenges through uh, supply chain disruption and following a hugely disruptive period through the pandemic. Uh, that is a very significant figure. We hear a lot from politicians, understandably, about the cost of living crisis, but very little in terms of the cost of doing business crisis, which underlies it. Some businesses are time poor, and I've already mentioned some of the pressures that are being endured and causing a distraction from the more strategic activities. And these pressures are often urgent uh, in the sense that the action must be taken immediately. Uh, whereas the need to make a plan on sustainability is unfortunately rarely seen as something that might, must be done straight away. And a similar picture emerges with regard to the measurement of carbon footprints. Only 9% of small businesses have measured, measured their carbon footprint uh, and over two-thirds acknowledging that they would not know how to do so. Completing this exercise is complex and requires allocating extra time uh, that most small businesses that are time constrained uh, do not have. It also requires repeated measuring uh, and monitoring to compare with previous uh, years their uh, progress in helping to meet net zero. Now, I'm conscious that I've painted quite a bleak picture uh, of the immense challenges that are being experienced by small businesses, but you'll be glad to hear I'll shift now to uh, a note of optimism and ambition. Uh, indeed, while each of the experiences uh, that are being endured by small businesses and people generally are brutal, uh, it is within the entrepreneurial spirit to innovate through adversity, tapping into the idea of never letting a good crisis go to waste. And it's clear uh, that businesses uh, will need support, though, and communities as well from uh, decision makers. But every interaction that I have with a small business in this role 
I've been left with a strong sense of admiration uh, at their resilience to help their community or their cause to ensure that their team is supported as effectively as possible. And in spite of everything I've said so far, our research consistently points to an underlying and enduring optimism. Small businesses want to thrive, want to recruit, want to innovate, and crucially, they want to help get us to net zero. They recognize that mission, and they recognize their responsibility in helping make it happen. If we are to capitalize on this opportunity, we need to ensure a think small approach to the net zero skills agenda, and the language that we use matters when we're talking about this. We hear about the skills agenda, we hear about uh, green skills and green jobs, and this has been touched on already, but what are they and why do they matter to learners and to businesses? So the way that we communicate with businesses and people more generally is an important first step in engaging with them effectively. It means talking to them in a way that outlines the clear benefit to them and the value of upskilling both across the short and longer terms. Understanding the value of skills and within the context of a series of spinning plates and competing pressures needs to be presented in a way that offers practical solutions rather than as a nicety or something that will only distract from this period of firefighting. This point also lends itself to the systems that we use. I recently spoke to an environmentally conscious business who enthusiastically signed up to a job creation scheme that would allow them to increase capacity whilst training a young person in role. They fully endorsed the concept and eagerly engaged with the process, but the reality of the implementation quickly soured that sentiment. The paperwork associated with it was extensive, and there was a perception that much of it was unnecessary or at least hugely challenging to fulfill they concluded that they would not proceed with the scheme and have been left with a damaged impression of apprenticeship schemes like that. Embedding a think small approach to skills means ensuring that learners and small businesses are able to uh, achieve ambitions and share in the benefits of prioritizing skills in a way that recognizes their limited resources and challenges they're experiencing at the moment rather than expectations to fill out onerous paperwork. So when we consider the challenges we face of cost of living issues, of inequalities, of transport uh, and wider infrastructure concerns, the bleak state of our town centres and uh, indeed the climate crisis, we need to ensure that solutions that we prioritise are holistic and avoid duplication or contradiction. And within the context of limited resources in public funds and challenges in leveraging investment, it's essential that we look to align our understanding of these areas and consider multifaceted proposals that reflect that. And many businesses are already adopting holistic solutions uh, organically. One of our members in North Wales who's involved in agricultural bedding products and logistics invested in modern telematics technology and trained drivers to be more environmentally aware, uh, serving to lower emissions, serving to keep their carbon footprint low, improving efficiencies as a business, and crucially to upskill their workforce in a way that's envir environmentally conscious. It's a simple intervention, but clearly within this context, very effective. FSB has called for and welcomed the Welsh Government's uh, green business loan scheme, uh, providing low-cost loans with consultancy to help support businesses lower their energy costs for good. As part of this process, ensuring that businesses are able to do the things like assess their carbon output and outline practical measures that they can take will be essential. I hope I've been able to adequately outline the importance of SMEs, the challenges that they face, and some of the practical opportunities uh, to consider how we can best engage SMEs in the skills agenda in the interests of our economy, our communities, and the environment. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to today's discussions. Climate emergency. We've 
done a couple of things. Well, the Senef has passed the, um, the 2015 Net Zero target, which is fantastic. And we have also published Net Zero Wales, which sets out how we're going to achieve our second carbon budget, which is, if I get it right, the years 2021 to 2025. Um, but it also sets out how we intend to get to 2030, which is uh, the third carbon budget, and indeed how we uh, aim to get to the long-term target of around uh, 2050. So within that plan, we made a commitment that we would uh, produce a net zero skills action plan um, and I would love to sit here today and tell you all about it. Unfortunately, in true civil service form, we are slightly overdue. And it is just going to ministers now for, for their sign-off. Um, so what I uh, hope I can do today is just sort of cover some of the context that we've uh, developed this plan within, um, talk to you about why the plan is so important, uh, also go through some of the high-level things that the plan will cover, um, and then our next steps. Um, so that's what I'm sort of intending to go through. So the context, um, this plan is kind of being written in some very, well, sort of unusually economic turbulent times, I'm sure you're aware. Since we, um, well, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, um, we've now had an invasion by Russia of Ukraine, which have all added to the sort of economic turbulence that we've seen. And although that will pass, uh, most economic turbulence does, there's some underlying trends uh, underneath that that we uh, need to take into account, uh, whether that's our aging population, uh, consumers, what we want is all changing but and, and the big one is, is climate change so that is uh, the sort of backdrop that we've been looking at uh, in terms of this plan um, so you know generally economies uh, they the well, we have sort of natural churn. Businesses are created every day. We lose businesses every day. And I think when we've been looking at this, the, the key thing for us is that net zero will, and the policies that we set, will kind of accentuate that natural churn and, and sort of lead to the, a change in the businesses that are created and the skills that we need. Um, when you look at sort of the IMF, it talks about um, the new sort of industries that will we will need will be quite actually modest compared to this natural churn and that the industries we will lose will be modest and I think when we've looked at that we've taken that as in the short term uh, as, as a sort of a conclusion that actually the key step for us in the short term for skills is essentially to consider all of that decarbonisation skills of, of, of the jobs that are, are every job roles that are here we've kind of heard that a little bit today um, all of our jobs really are going to be tweaked and have to adjust to, to a, a decarbonizing uh, future. Um, why do we need the plan? I mean, from a political standpoint, it's, it's really important. And also, Wales is a little bit behind. Should I sit up here and say Welsh Government is behind the curve on this? But we are one of the only governments in the UK who have not uh, put anything out there on, on net zero skills. So it's really important that we do. Um, and, you know, we've heard a little bit today already about the confusion. There's a lot of confusion, whether that's businesses, employees, actually some of our school leavers, as to what, um, you know, what, what does net zero mean? What does it mean for skills that they need uh, going forward? So um, we've considered that. And also, I think it's really important that we look at our skill system. Is it fit for purpose? Does it or will it deliver what we need uh, going forward? So what have we considered within the plan? We've kind of got like seven uh, key areas. We, we start off by looking at the sector landscape, which WCPP have, have helped us with, and, and it's been fantastic. And it's wonderful that they will be sort of publishing their plan alongside uh, the action plan. So um, we won't be repeating all of the wonderful evidence within uh, the WCPP work in, in our action plan, um, but it will certainly be uh, highlighting the key things. So we've structured it around the eight key emission sectors that we uh, talked about in the net zero plan back in 2021. So that's how we've structured that. Um, and just to, uh, so the second area we'll be looking at is that understanding net zero skills. We've heard already this morning, what is a net zero skills job? What is a green job? There is so much confusion out there. So we, we attempt to, to, to talk about that. Um, 
sort of third and fourth, we've got sort of, we talk about the skills workforce and the skills systems and the opportunities. Um, I think it's quite clear that there's a need for flexibility in the skills system, how we deliver, how we reskill, uh, how we upskill uh, people. Most of us um, have busy jobs, so how, how, do we, how do we do that with, when we're already working? And we've heard about the wolf today, which is uh, a fantastic program which helps, helps us do that. Um, and within that, we, we talk about our green PLA pilot, which we launched uh, last year, for those of you who are not aware. And it's a two-year program, uh, and what we aim to do, we've we're basically uh, looking at reskilling and upskilling in um, construction, energy, manufacturing, and engineering sectors to start with. We've removed the wage cap, so anybody uh, in those sectors can, can take part. Um, and we've tried to make it as flexible as possible so that you can uh, continue to work and, and study. Um, and we've also got sort of expert industry bodies and our regional skills partnerships to help uh, tell us what are the sort of qualifications that we need. So this is a, a two-year pilots um, and we, we you know as most pilots we hope to learn a lot from it it won't be perfect right now but uh, we, we aim to get it there um, so the fifth thing that we will be looking at in the action plan is our young people and early years because this is absolutely key to where we're going uh, I've talked a lot about reskilling and upskilling of, of those of us in the workforce but for all of our youngsters coming through it's absolutely integral that um, they understand what it's all about and, and what are the opportunities trying to explain to uh, somebody, a teenager at the moment, what a, a green job is, they just look at you as if you're absolutely barking mad. And in fact, it's really hard to explain what some of these jobs are because we don't know what they are going to be. So there's a little bit of a leap of faith uh, uh, there. Um, sixthly, we would be talking about the partnership approach and that is absolutely key here welsh government can't do it on its own businesses can't do it on its own nobody can do it on its own we really do need to work all together uh, and so that will be a, a big part of of the plan and the, and the final section that it will look at is is just transition it is absolutely essential that nobody is left behind as we move forward um and you know that it's equal uh, and and it's fair so that's the sort of high level um bits that the plan will be covering our next steps, firstly, we pray that uh, uh, our ministers will agree this in the next week or so, and then we can publish it in February. It uh, would be wonderful that they could go out together. Uh, I am relatively hopeful of, of this. Um, the next steps um, is uh, sort of uh, looking at the skills, uh, what skills we need and a public consultation. So we have uh, done our best to consult in a very short period of time with as many um, stakeholders as we can to do this, but we're very conscious that this action plan, which I will just say, guys, it doesn't, it's not got the answers. It's more about setting the scene. This is our first stab at it. And then the really, really important work comes after that, which will be a public consultation about the skills we need. Then we will get, hopefully, out of all of that information, a roadmap. So, um, yeah, so that, that, that's basically where we are from a Welsh Government perspective. This is our first stab to really pull stuff together uh, and get us all, hopefully, um, commenting on it. You know, the best thing we can do from this is people, you know, everybody to come back and say, well, hold on a minute, you've forgotten this, that and the other, which is fantastic because this is, this is just the start. So I'm going to chair the panel from here because I think <clears throat> it's something to do with cameras. I need to stay still, otherwise people will strongly distract <laughs> me. But this is an opportunity now for you guys, the audience, to uh, fire questions at our um, speakers or the panel members. So um, I'm going to do the usual thing of kicking off by asking a question from the chair, but be thinking about the questions you want to ask, and the colleagues will come around with microphones for you to speak into. We ask that you do that because we have audience members uh, joining us remotely and they won't be able to hear your question if you do not have a microphone in your hand. So get thinking about um, your question. Um, I think these microphones work, so I think... Can someone wave at me if I need to shout into a microphone? I think this one's working. Yeah, okay, we're good. Um, so... Um, Oh, no, I've got this one too. Um, so my, my, my question to kick us off, I guess, is, um, I mean, we've heard a lot about some of, uh, some of the short-term challenges that we as a society are facing and how that links across to the challenge of trying to think about a 
transition to net zero and the skills needs associated with that and how do you upskill, reskill and ensure that those that are joining the workforce have the necessary skills. Um, and I'm interested in, um, I guess, uh, reflections on, on opportunities. So I think if, if, my question is, if you could wave a magic wand and make something happen, what's the, what would be the most significant thing you would try and make happen in order to facilitate the changes that we've been talking about, given the context and the challenges that we've been talking about. So it's quite, a, 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 no one's making eye contact, so I've asked <laughs> too tricky a question. Um, but uh, Shivana, do you want to go first? Um, well, I would say that given that we're in a process of introducing legislation on social partnership, I think that that's what we would, that's what I, my, 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 my wish or desire or Wave my magic wand moment would be is, is that we follow that model of social partnership because I think there hasn't been a speaker that hasn't referenced collaborative co-production co-working and the fact that the Welsh government is in the process of you know after this report you know going through a public consultation I think we need to move forward you know in that you know in that sort of promise and, and in that vein. Great. Does anybody want to add to that? Great. I think particularly after how bleak I was in the initial 10 minutes, <laughs> I, I better take this opportunity with my, uh, with my wand to be more positive. Um, well, going back slightly just on the negativity, um, the period of firefighting at the moment is a real distraction from allowing businesses or people more generally to think about how sustainable uh, they could be and in terms of those more strategic activities. Um, so allowing businesses that space would be the priority. So I do think that uh, intervention is needed to get businesses and people through this cost of living and cost of doing business crisis. But like I was saying earlier, uh, and I did consider whether or not I should include the remark about never letting a good crisis go to waste, um, but I do think it is important that when we are thinking about the solutions to the energy crisis or to the skills uh, shortages that we think about these challenges more holistically and there's other things in that as well about you know town centre revival mm -hmm. and transformation as well as what we're talking about today in terms of the climate crisis so really uh, making sure the decision makers consider those challenges holistically uh, and helping to route forward uh, a roadmap that allows businesses to really take part in this agenda. Thank you. Yeah, I um, build on the points about collaboration, actually, and involving different actors, but quite specifically to develop data um, to inform future strategy and future planning over the longer term, because I think this is where a lot more could be done. But actually, I'd point to all of the different bodies, um, when I say bodies, sorry, that's too vague a term, uh, businesses, um, workers, regional skills partnership, Welsh government, um, local authorities feeding into the data so that the data is collected from all different levels within the economy and then informs the um, development of strategies and plans. Thank you. And then finally, Emma, I've been waved at, so you need to hold this apparently oh. for people to hear you. But if, you, if you've got your magic wand answer. I think to be able to understand uh, the future a little bit more, so even the next 10 years and what decarbonisation means for, for skills specifically, writing, looking at this action plan, it's so incredibly difficult to pin down what the exact skills and where some technologies are going. So if you look at aerospace, is it hydrogen, is it green fuel? So if we knew a little bit more with certainty where some of these uh, industries are going, it would really, really help us um, sort of uh, manoeuvre the education system behind it, further education and HE don't move that quickly, uh, it would just, you know, it, and you've got the chicken and egg with uh, sort of the education and, and, and future skills. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, can I have a show of hands of who would like to ask um, questions from the room? Okay, thank you. I've got a lady at the front here. Um, I'm going to take uh, three questions. If you could introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Uh, hi. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that microphone's working. The red light is on. 
We're so used to tech issues with online meetings. We've got our <laughs> You've forgotten that. Yeah. Yeah. I've forgotten the beauty of all these issues. The feedback. One for the room, yeah, yeah, it seems. Um, do you mind starting again? Sorry. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah. Do you want to tap at the top? No. There we go. This wasn't scary enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, fixing the yeah. text issues. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Tanya Nash. I, I work for my own micro business, uh, Future Clarity, a coaching consultancy facilitation, um, helping people put sustainability at the heart of what they do. Uh, but I'm also the hub lead for Wales and the Women in Sustainability Network. So any women here who want to come and have a chat with me afterwards, please do. Because I wanted to get the push out there. <laughs> Promotion out first. Um, in terms of the net zero skills, what I was really interested in, a lot of the discussion was around technical skills, and I think, Helen, you touched on it, and certainly, Shivani, you touched on it, yeah. the lack of those softer skills. If they're not existing in, the, in, in that transition, where do they sit? So s skills such as critical thinking, interpersonal skills, um, leadership skills, in styles that might need to shift in order to be able to accelerate um, the, the transition, such as being promoted by the Inner Development Goals, which is an initiative supporting the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Where, you know, in terms of what you found and your experience, how are these skills um, running alongside the sort of technical changes that, are, that we might need? Thank you. Um, did people who wanted to ask questions want to put their hands up again so I can remember where you are? I've got, um, there's, uh, okay, I'm going to ask, because this guy's just here, uh, I should know your name, Stan's just next to you, Charlotte. I'm going to ask Stan and then the gentleman at the back. <laughs> test, test, cool, that's working. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Stan Townsend, I work on the um, Net Zero 2035 group has been mentioned, hence why Dan knows my name. Um, I've been teed up nicely by Emma because I'm interested in this sort of chicken and egg relationship between preparedness and readiness for industry versus, I guess, what should, could this industry look like in Wales in this context of decarbonised economy. Uh, so I'm interested in all the kind of panelist perspectives on what could, should industry look like in Wales, noting the sort of skills that we already have, um, and maybe even some of the skills that are not being used currently but could be used in a more decarbonised economy. An example in my head is a business in Carmarthenshire um, that produces uh, kind of sustainable genes called Hyatt Genes, and they actually... Um, sort of rejuvenated a uh, kind of lost industry, the textile industry in that area of Carmarthenshire sort of died a death, but was then rejuvenated through um, this business, if you like. So interested in your thoughts in that and using that uh, example. Thank you. Thanks. And then there's a gentleman at the end of the row at the, at the back there. And I said three, but I think there was one more somewhere around here. Uh, and then we'll have another round of questions in a minute. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, Clive Ormsley from Natural Resources Wales. Um, my question really is, there's a whole, when we talk about net zero skills, there's a whole array of skills from the interpersonal skills that have just been mentioned by another questioner, but also one of the things that we find challenging now is actually people actually understanding what net zero means. And then, of course, how do you actually account for carbon, whether that be in a business, whether that be in terms of the landscape and in terms of land use, all, all, all of these things are important. So, my question really is, what, what do you think are the priorities of net zero skills, and how do we sequence them? Because in a sense, if people don't understand what net zero is, then, you know, we're, we're not starting from a very good place. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to suggest we take those, <coughs> and then I've seen that there's two more, so we'll, we'll, we'll take those questions first. Thank you. Um, so um, I think I'm going to link the last question and the first one around skills and the nature of skills that we need and the, and the sequencing, which, is quite, uh, which I also um, heard you mention around kind of what, what are the priorities, what, what do, almost what, if you think about what people need to learn, what do they need to learn first in order to have a grounding for things that they then subsequently need to learn and, and in order for them to have the skills that they need. Helen, I know some of the work that we did looked at the skills requirements, so I wondered if you wanted to pick up um, first on, on that question of the balance between softer, harder skills and, and some of the questions around priorities to the extent that our work touched on that. Yeah. 
I think we're just going to use the one mic. Yeah. Stick like it on the safe side, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's a really difficult question, so thank you for handing it to me first. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think, actually, I, I wouldn't, I'd find it very difficult to identify clear priorities because I think a lot of these things are, of course, in reality happening simultaneously. And I think a lot of um, businesses, as Spretz outlined, are feeling that they're under a lot of pressure and um, larger organizations as well to, to make the changes. But I think the softer skill that I'd point to is the, the leadership having that understanding of what the transition means for the particular organization and then being able to feed that through all different tiers of the of their their business um, and being able to communicate that and translate it but I think there's also part of that so I, I definitely point to the softer skills and the managerial and the leadership which is critical but at the same time there's an aspect of keeping up to date as technologies evolve and to an extent um, firms being able to leapfrog and be quick adopters of technologies that are emerging elsewhere and I think um, as has already been discussed the challenge of being able to understand what those future technologies are and being able to respond to those in terms of strategies and, and visions is is a real challenge. So I'm probably not going to answer the question very clearly in terms of saying it's A, B, and C in that order, but I think there's a lot of complex things. Um, and it's, uh, in a sense, the ideal of the, the huge wicked problem that needs to be solved where to do with the degree of complexity that's involved. Thank you. I'm going to pass the microphone um, down. Emma, I was, I was going to come to you next, mm -hmm. um, because I think this question of um, what skills are needed and what the prioritisation across that would be. You mentioned something in your remarks around the work that the IMF have done and how, if I've understood what you were saying correctly, that for you implied that actually there's not in the short term a need for a dramatic change in, in skills. Actually, that there's, there's a need for, or, or a particular prioritisation of change in skills. There's a need for us collectively as a whole workforce to be adapting over time. But have I misunderstood that? Or, and is there another way of you, that you've been thinking about um, that question about what the skills are needed and what the prioritization of those are? Yeah, I think that, you know, that's what the IMF uh, uh, are saying. And I think what we've realized is it's not just about the new industries that will be created and will be needed for, for a net zero transition, but we have a whole workforce that's already out there who will need to tram you sort of be part of the transition as well. So I think um, when we've been thinking about it, um, you know, the actual workforce that are in place now is bigger. <laughs> and uh, so if you're thinking, when we're thinking about sort of, you know, retraining, um, uh, a gas engineer or an electrician to do things that we need now that is kind of what we're thinking about that's the immediate and actually there's a lot of upskilling in that but also a lot of job opportunities as then the construction industry starts to evolve and house building starts to evolve so it, it's um, a kind of a, a bit of both but we've we've realized that you know it's not just about the new industries that, mm. that will will be coming and um, and I guess from the skills perspective yeah one, one of the things the action plan is thinking very much about on the back of the research you've done is all of those transferable skills so what gives our future um, sort of uh, colleagues and, and ourselves the most opportunity to be able to adapt is transferable skills so yes yeah, softer skills um, the essential skills digital skills are, are going to be all key so there's lots of sort of things that we've started exploring thanks to the research that that you guys have have done and then just picking up the point there about the chicken and egg it, it's really mm -hmm. difficult um, and we quite often when they're skills based, it's they look at you with your skills and your title and say, well, you need to just change what FE delivered, you need to do that. And it's like, well, then you go back and you ask people, what do you want? And it's like, oh, well, uh... so it's really difficult. I don't know the answer to it, unfortunately. But hopefully by something like doing our little um, per uh, personal learning account uh, pilot, seeing how we can do that and train people already uh, in work and, and using the sort of Wolf program and things like that, we can start trying to learn how, how we do it. Thank you. I'm keen to get another round of questions, and we've just reached our midday deadline. But um, Brett or Shivana, did you want to um, pick up anything in response to 
those questions? Um, I just wanted particular? to say um, that what Bob has just said now about um, transferable skills is really important because, as I mentioned, and I will continue to mention, you know, a just and green transition is where no one is left behind. Mm. Um, and, you know, for example, we're talking about steel and the future of steel and the electrification of steel. Again, we need to make sure that the current workforce um, then has the transferable skills that are going to be needed for that new type of industry, the changes in that industry as well. Um, but if we don't actually prepare people, um, and if we don't actually make sure that people have negotiating and bargaining skills so they can bargain for a better future for themselves, there will be individuals that get left behind. Thank you. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it open for one more round of questions. Um, we've got uh, two here in the same row, um, and then I saw this gentleman here in the front. His hand go up first. I'm afraid that I'm going to call it at three, so apologies. James, uh, okay, well, mm. no, 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 it doesn't matter. We're going to take all three and then answer. Um, <clears throat> my name's Nigel Pugh. I work for Cody the Woodland Trust in Wales. Um, my main concern is how do you decarbonise global corporates that are currently embedded within Welsh communities? Um, how do you take control of those carbon outputs? I'm James Lewis, I'm the director of AirLab, the Public Services Innovation Lab for Wales. Unsurprisingly, I'm particularly interested in building capacity for public service innovation. For the purposes of this, define innovation as successfully, implement successfully implementing new ideas. So, I'm really interested in what skills and support you think Welsh public servants in particular, and that's local government, Welsh government, health boards, etc need to enable them to help drive this transition in a time of poly crisis it's not just one crisis we have multiple overlapping but distinct crises so what are the skills and support you see in welsh public servants need to do this thank you david warren from swansea university uh, my questions around the actual skills delivery side of it then um, so i know emma touched on some of the our, our ability to react um, but to, to the panel feel that we've got that connectivity between the multi-level skills we've, we've spoken as a, a place for higher education obviously the, the innovation side the dissemination of that back into the workforce but also the accessibility side of it then for people who are in work and not just the conventional uh, following the, the school up to higher education is, is that accessibility there that we feel is needed for decarb thank you i'll wait for a second for the mic to come to us Thank you. So um, we've got th the three questions there around um, how to decarbonise large corporate co corporates that are embedded in communities in Wales. Um, what kind of skills are needed in the public sector for, for innovation? Um, uh, and last one about the what I heard you to be asking about, which was the, the multi-level skills system. So uh, kind of reflections on the what needs to happen for our skills system and the connections across. Uh, the multiple levels. So I'm going to just ask each panel member to pick up on, on you don't have to answer all three, uh, you can get to choose, but hopefully we'll cover all three as, as we go along. So I'm going to pass over to you first. Um, yeah, I guess I'll try and pick up on the skill system uh, point other than to say, um, I don't know at the moment, <laughs> but the action plan, what the action plan will do, which I forgot to say, is it does set out a lot of actions about how we want to start working in different spaces, and, and, and David, I know you're doing a lot of fantastic work down in, in Swansea, and uh, you know the team work really closely with you, and, and that's fantastic, and, and I guess from my perspective, we need to see much more of that uh, across Wales, but yeah, um, I don't... I don't know the answers at the moment, but you know, I think having the public consultation that we will do this year as well, which hopefully will help to, to still tease out some of these issues. Thank you. Um, in terms of the public sector, I think one of the things that was quite interesting, again, going back to our reference COVID earlier, was there was a time when there were so many different jobs that people did um, that we were told couldn't be done remotely, couldn't be done from home, and it meant that lots of women in particular and people with caring responsibilities, for example, all of a sudden were cut out of the workforce. 
Um, now that we are moving more positively towards like a hybrid version of, of working and having lots of people coming into the public sector from a variety of different backgrounds, I think that in itself really helps us as far as that decarbonisation um, and the plan for the future is concerned. But again, what we can't be in a position is, is that where we have people working remotely, for example, that when opportunities for career advancement or progression, for example, come into play, um, that they are forgotten about because they're sat behind a screen somewhere else and all of a sudden they're not a, they're not a party to the discussions that are taking place about that decarbonization the other area I think that we really need to think about um, decarbonization it's gonna be a big one for us is the NHS uh, what does that mean and I at the moment we are specifically looking at buildings for example do we need all the space that we have etc um, but I think it needs to go a, a lot further and deeper the example that I gave earlier on about the um, electric uh, vehicles and, and the fleet of vehicles um, within the councils and I think we need to have those types of examples but the truth of the matter is is that the more we look at this at the moment uh, the more we are somewhat struggling for case studies so um, we need to do some more work um, but I think the starting point in all of this is really to make sure that we have um, you know, agreements in place, transition agreements in place, where all parties um, take that decision. And as far as uh, big corporations, I think that there have been lots of discussions in Wales about the creation of a circular economy. Um, I know that the FSB in particular has you know, spoken on these issues uh, for a long time now. Um, I think that we need to look at what alternative options there are for Wales. And we have been talking about having, um, uh, you know, our own energy, for example, specifically for Wales, that's Welsh owned. You know, when do we move to that position to make those things uh, a reality and give more localised and medium sized businesses in Wales that, you know, are committed to fair work, that do recognise unions, that opportunity instead of those big corporations. Uh, perversely, for the representative from small businesses, I'm going to address the, uh, the global corporate uh, question. Um, Wales has a well-known policy contention of the missing middle, those firms that struggle to grow and then stay within Wales. Um, what we know from what motivates small businesses from our work on what we value, that's the policy title, policy report title, was that small businesses care about their communities, they are environmentally conscious, in many cases they are community leaders. So what we need is to give them the tools to help grow uh, and then stay within wills to you know, address these issues around net zero skills. Um, and just a final point and sort of addressing the points earlier around uh, technical skills versus you know, the transferable or softer skills. Uh, and just to emphasize the importance of that, not to just um, give in to the temptation sometimes that uh, you know, even I've thought about of green skills within the context only of semiconductor clusters or hydrogen, those types of yeah. sectors. But to you know, apply the the chip shop test. What does this mean to the chip shop down the road? How can they uh, decarbonise and think about how they can invest in new technologies, invest in their staff to be more envir environmentally conscious, and then commun uh, cumulatively benefit um, from addressing everyone, not just. Uh, the sort of uh, the sectors that we typically think of within the context of these discussions. Thank you. And then do you want to find the final word? Sure. Okay. Um, I think there's a, there's a thread um, that responds to David and um, Nigel's question, which is um, to do with uh, multi-skilling at all levels um, and the importance of working with communities when multinationals are going through the transition. Um, and also in communities developing the skills, the essential skills when they need to be um, lifted. And a bit, an important part of that is removing barriers to people accessing education. So for example, with the lifelong learning project that I've spoken about, um, if people, if through for example, investment in infrastructure support to enable people to attend courses and attend training, um, and also communicating to people at all levels to let them know what training is available so that they can access it. Um, I think there's a lot more that can be said um, in response to all of the interesting comments that have come forward, but I won't, I'll stop there, I won't try and take any more on. Thanks. Awesome. Relay most of the microphone. Um, uh, thank you. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I, I have to um, bring the conversation to a close there, and hopefully, we can continue the conversation um, over lunch. Apologies for, for overrunning. 
um, by 10 minutes, but I was keen to let the, another round of com uh, questions come through. I'll just finish by saying thank you very much uh, for giving your time, and thanks for, especially to the panellists and to the speakers uh, today. Um, and I look forward to keeping the conversation going through lunch and for the rest of the day. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the session. Um, we've got about 90 minutes um, to actually look at, in many ways, the key questions of uh, what we need to do in the context of delivery of net zero. So this session is very much on uh, growth, degrowth, and a circular economy. And we'll have three speakers uh, who will contribute different views um, for us to digest. But then we hope that we'll be able to allow a lot of time for there to be contributions uh, from the audience because there are so many skills, so much experience, so much knowledge uh, in this room, and we want to be able to capture this uh, in, 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 in this dialogue. Um, so the purpose of this session is going to be looking at whether and how economic growth is compatible with net zero in the context of the Wales Centre of Public Policy's think pieces um, Mark Linus, uh, Lucas Bunce, um, uh, we specifically looked at in, in this context, and wider considerations including whether economic growth facilitates new technological development that can help reduce emissions, i.e. in Mark Linus, um, uh, a new generation nuclear power, direct carbon capture, improvements in energy storage, etc., or how resource use may need to be curtailed and or circularity improved in the context of biophysical limits to growth and the extent to which this impact on economic growth more broadly conceived and the extent to which these considerations fit within and contribute to the five ways of working, the seven well-being goals under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, perhaps I should say at the, uh, at, at the outset, um, uh, I'm Jane Davidson, <laughs> as it says on the slide, and it's really interesting to see uh, you know, my name without any attribution nowadays um, as somebody who's an ex-minister uh, and, and, and an ex-university um, uh, manager. Um, I am now chair of the Wales Net Zero 2035 Challenge Group. And I think it's probably important at the beginning of this session for me to say a little bit about what that is and the way in which, um, if you wish to, there will be an open invitation uh, to contribute towards our work. The Welsh Government and Plaid Cymru uh, announced a cooperation agreement uh, in 2021, which is a formal relationship between the two parties, and that agreement runs uh, until December 2024. And one of the specific commitments in the agreement was to commission independent advice to examine potential pathways to net zero by 2035. The current date is 2050. This will look at the impact on society and sectors of our economy and how any adverse effects may be mitigated, including how the costs and benefits are shared fairly. We support devolution of further powers and resources Wales needs to respond most effectively to reach net zero. So that is the um, paragraph that is in the cooperation agreement. And I was invited to lead this work and the first meeting of the new independent Wales Net Zero 2035 Challenge Group established under the agreement met earlier this month. And there will be a ministerial statement very shortly announcing the members of the group. Um, so until that, that comes out, um, I can't share that those details. Though what is important is that the group is working to two political parties, and therefore somewhere in the region of two-thirds of the members of the Senev. And it is certainly my hope and the hope of others in the group and we were reassured by our meeting both with the minister, um, Julie James, the climate minister, and the designated member from Plaid Cymru, Sean Gwentlian, that they are prioritizing this work. And we are hopeful as a group that the pathways that we look forward to being able to describe will then be adopted in the context of the next election 
uh, of the Senedd in 2026. It is, our work um, at the moment is scheduled from now and, until uh, the summer of 2024. Um, and we would hope that beyond that there would be opportunities to actually create pilots and other opportunities to demonstrate and test the outcomes of our work. We're also ambitious about the idea that if we reach conclusions as a group, that those conclusions will be publicly put out there when we reach them. So they will be open for debate, open for uh, consideration, op open for uh, challenge, as well as open for adoption um, by individuals, by organisations, by public sector um, organisations, by the government and others. So we're very much looking to use the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And you saw in Rhiannon's presentation earlier, for those of you who are not fully familiar with the work, that actually the very nature of the act and the way it encompasses a just transition, the way it encompasses biodiversity enhancement, the way the five ways of working require people to be preventative, to think long-term, to collaborate with each other, to integrate the goals, outcomes, and to involve people about whom decisions are being made are practices that we're going to be utilising in the group, in the delivery of our work. So we're not only using the opportunity of the Act in terms of the public sector uh, being required to deliver on the outcomes, we want to use the structures of the Act as a way of demonstrating better decision making. Um, and I think at this point, that is probably all I can say about it. I will be here um, in the tea time session afterwards, so I'm happy to pick up any individual comments, um, but I am just going to ask the, the uh, Stan Townsend, the secretary, to stand up. <laughs> um, Stan comes from a climate finance COP negotiating background out of the cabinet office. Um, and so the two of us are charged with the responsibility, along with all the members of group and the observers, um, quite a few of whom are in this room already, in terms of looking at delivering on the outcome. And if you uh, want to make yourselves known to Stan, we will be putting um, uh, out a public opportunity in due course. We will have a public place in which our uh, deliberations are published. Uh, since we've only had one meeting, we're still in very early processes. But by Easter, we should be absolutely clear that we can, we'll have something that anybody uh, here wants to contribute to. I need to say that partly why I'm standing here is because I'm delighted that the Wales Centre for Public Policy will provide, provide the evidence stream underpinning this work. Um, and therefore, there will be a, a very close collaboration um, but their work will be obviously uh, need to be peer reviewed in the normal way. Um, those of you who are in the room who know me will know that I'm likely to be more opportunistic in terms of how we find the fastest and best routes, but to test them as widely as possible. And that means I'm particularly delighted uh, to have been asked to chair this session. Because when we think of those challenges uh, that I outlined about you know, economic growth, about resource use, about how this fits with a country that is the first in the world to legislate for the well-being of future generations, these are not easy issues. Um, and the moment you start thinking of you know, what are the enablers, what is the conversation um, that can happen to, to make this easier? How do we communicate? How do we take the Welsh people with us on this journey? How do we find out what the best routes are for delivery? All these things, which is about not having a conversation within a political sphere or a policy sphere, but having a conversation for Wales, in Wales, by Wales, for Wales. So real challenges uh, to us and the way we work, but I hope that those challenges will also help in the, in the sense of either giving good or bad advice to others as they want to go on this journey as well. But in the context of more provocation, you've had provocation in the sessions that we've been at just now. Really, I was at Energy Networks, absolutely 
fascinating session, and I could have carried on for another hour there. And I think that's what the big opportunity of today's conference is. It's provocation. It's looking at what are, what are the best ways forward on delivery. So I'm delighted um, for this afternoon to be uh, joined by three very special people in this context. Um, over on my far right, that does not sound appropriate in terms of Lucas's work, but is Lucas Bunce, Policy and Engagement Lead at the Wellbeing Economy Alliance Scotland. Now, some of you will know that um, there's an active Wellbeing Economy Alliance in Wales, that Wales, along with Scotland, is a member of WEGO, the Wellbeing Econo uh, Economy Governments. Um, Lucas lives in Glasgow. He's passionate about transforming our economic system so it can deliver rapid reductions in carbon emissions in a socially just manner. And in his PhD research, he specifically investigated how structural change in the economy could contribute to such a transformation to a post-growth or well-being economy. Next to Lucas, uh, you've met her already, um, Dr. Helen Tilley, Senior Research Fellow at the Wales Centre for Public Policy. And as you heard earlier, Helen leads the centre's work on the economy. And her research interests include political economy, the politics of research and evidence update, the economic growth and productivity challenges facing Wales. But she also brings a backstory, which I think is incredibly important in this context. She's worked extensively in international development in Africa and Asia, Asia with governments and donors, um, including um, Davos, the World Bank, the European Commission, and UN agencies. And the third member of our panel, who's a, um, an old friend and challenger of the work that I do, Nick Miller from Miller Research, a highly experienced public policy consultant with more than 20 years' experience of tackling challenging projects across the UK, um, especially those that include sustainability, innovation, programming, evaluation, and decarbonisation across all sectors. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to our first contributor, Lucas. Okay, uh, hello to all of you from me as well. Um, thank you for the introduction, Jane. I'm very excited to be here. Um, although... I think I would start from the point that the question that Jane posed in the beginning, which is kind of part of the theme of this discussion, is whether um, gr growth is in the economy is compatible with decarbonization. I personally think it's not actually a, a very useful question, and I hope we're not going to spend the whole of the session discussing that. So my um, background, as Jane outlined, is I've done research in the kind of post-growth community. Um, I now work for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, and I think there's a lot of overlap between different approaches in this field, whether it's well-being, you call it well-being economy, post-growth, degrowth, uh, donut economics, steady state economy, and various different ones. So today I'm kind of going to be speaking as part of that community, I would say. Um, and as part of that community, I've had my fair share, my fair share of debates around is green growth possible or not. And while there can be a lot of fun, um, as I said, I don't think they're very useful, and for, primarily for the reason that I think they can actually distract from what we have in common, and I think there's a couple of important points, and the first one is that, um, that I think whether you believe that green growth is possible or not doesn't actually change what we have to do about climate change. In terms of the environmental side, the, the steps we have to do to tackle climate change is pretty much the same. In, um, and advocated for in both communities. You know, we, need, we know we need to phase out fossil fuels, we need to um, you know, increase renewable energy, we need to insulate our houses, we need to invest in public transport, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think the second um, important point is that also in terms of the vision, there's important agreement in the sense that, you know, I think that we now know that there's no trade-off between decarbonization and a better quality of life, that we can decarbonize the economy even as, you know, as quickly as we have to do. Um, and I think 2035 is probably 
internationally looking at our responsibility fairer goal to aim for. Um, but we can achieve that without, with actually ending up with a better quality of life for people. And that's also shared in general, whether you believe in green growth or more in the post-growth camp. And I think it's important to hold on to these points um, in these discussions. I think where the difference comes in is more like once you start looking at the assumptions, what's going to happen to our economy if we actually get serious about, about climate change? Because at the moment, even though we had really good progress and good successes, we're still nowhere near at the kind of decarbonization rates that we, have, that we need to see. And um, it was good to see this morning in the Energy Network session to make that point is that we really need to start thinking about the question how we can speed things up. And I guess from, from my perspective, I would say that you know, we can achieve that. We can do it in a way that increases quality of life. But at the end of the day, that massive challenge of decarbonizing that quickly is going to leave us in a place where GDP, as it's currently measured, is going to be small or at least not growing um, as fast as it might be doing at the moment. Or they might not be growing at the moment at all at the moment. Um, so. And fundamentally, from a post-growth perspective, that's not an issue because we know GDP in itself is not a very good measure of progress. It's not actually very closely related to quality of life. But the way our current economy is structured is it couldn't deal with that economic transformation that would happen as, as part of the impact of when we decarbonize. And so the challenge from a post-growth perspective is how can we redesign the economy so it can actually cope with the kind of decarbonization things that we have to do at this at the pace and scale that we have to do them. And restructuring our economy around the things that we value and around different goals. And that kind of position is very much based on the evidence of um, the close relationships between GDP and, and carbon emissions and energy use in the past. And now obviously other people might disagree with that. Um, people uh, like Mark set up in his piece. And if that was just an academic debate, I would say, you know, that's fine, I don't care. Let's actually try it, you know? Let's do everything we have to do to get to net zero much quicker than we are at the moment. Let's throw the kitchen sink at it. And in 20 or 30 years, we're gonna find out who was right, whether it was Mark or whether it was me. Um, but I think the problem is that it's not an academic debate, it's very much a political debate. And that's partially why I moved into the, into the policy space. And, and I think the more interesting question to discuss is whether that green growth narrative and that green growth story and the kind of prioritization of GDP that it supports is helpful in getting us to our, our targets of decarbonization or not. And in my opinion, um, I think it's very much part of the narrative and part of the arguments that are used to delay climate action to the point um, where we have to make them. And I think I just want to highlight like two important points around there. And the first one is that it often the green growth narratives come to the assumption that any kind of growth is good because it's just one figure. Whereas more sensibly, we have to start asking the questions, what are the things we have to grow and what are the things we have to uh, scale down? And politicians are very good at talking about the former, not as good talking about the second one. And I think by kind of, and the challenges are really, I think it kind of, that underestimates the challenge because I think when you really think through what we have to do to get to net zero, whether 2035, 2050, to get to a circular economy, you're actually essentially eliminating the business models that underpin a very large part of our current economy, whether that is, and it's not just in the oil and gas industry, whether you look at the finance sector, whether you look at retail and the manufacturing that's behind that, whether you look into agriculture. And, and I think we need to have some honest conversations about how you manage these kind of transformations and these kind of impacts. Um, and that then, but basically because growth is all about like, oh, any kind of growth is good, you end up with a political argument. Uh, you can very easily argue against climate change mitigation measures. I, um, I thought the really point that stuck me from Mark's piece is where he says, oh, well, we just need to move to a plant-based diet, you know, as part of his green growth program. And I was like, yeah, obviously, that's great. I fully support that. Most people in the degrowth community would support that as well. 
But when you think about it, any government seriously about bringing in measures that would massively reduce meat and dairy consumption, you would get a massive backlash from that industry. And what they will tell you is, oh, if you do that, that's going to reduce growth and it's going to reduce jobs. Um, and also, it's going to reduce our profits, but they're not going to tell you that necessarily. And so even, I think in that sense, that kind of focus on growth is often used to prevent some of the actions we have to do, even whether you believe in, in whether green growth is possible or not. And I think the second, and I feel like I'm probably running out of time, but the second and I think more important point for me is that I think green growth and the narratives around that and focus on technology really distract from the big problem of inequality that we have in terms of wealth and income and carbon emissions as well. Um, like, I think by now, actually, it would be the main in climate change and decarbonization should be considered as an inequality problem rather than as a technological problem because a lot of the technological solutions are there or getting there. But where we are is in a situation where the, vast, the majority of carbon emissions is really produced by a very small part of the global population, where the, a lot of the growth in carbon emissions is also related to the lifestyle of that very small um, part of the, the global population. And, and if you don't start your decarbonization from that point, and how you reduce that inequality in wealth and income and, and, and carbon emissions, you're not going to get anywhere near the rates and the goals that we have to see. Um, and prioritizing growth, basically, um, is basically used as an excuse not to do that, I think. So, so I'll stop there, but I think really the point from my perspective and the post-growth perspective is that you know, we need to step, take a step back. We need to look at, okay, what is actually the values that we want to structure our economy around? Because we can create a different economy, a system that caters to our needs, that you know, provides with the things that we need, that provides a healthy natural environment that we can decarbonize very quickly, and um, that has a lot of jobs for everybody. But I don't think that's going to be compatible with GDP growth. Um, and if we keep making that priority, we're going to set the wrong priorities, and we're going to go in the wrong direction. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Lucas, thank you, thank you so much. Like, that was a really interesting. And can I just ask you one question at this point? I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions for you um, after other speakers have, have contributed. But I think that um, a few people are starting to comment on Chris Skidmore's work um, uh, for uh, the Liz Trust. Um, uh, but obviously one of the things that he said in his report that I skimmed yesterday um, is that actually the UK is well placed uh, to capitalize on green growth opportunities. Now you've been very clear in your, in your presentation that in a sense we have to move to more circular type approaches. How do we look at that kind of proposition at this point in time? I think, yeah, it's a very popular line, I think. I have to admit I haven't actually read Chris, Chris's report, but um, it's probably, but that line is used a lot by the Scottish government. It's basically, you know, we're now, that seems to be like a general narrative is, look, with climate change, we're on the right track. Look at all the great opportunities that it brings. And that is true, obviously. I mean, there is business opportunities. There are a lot of win-wins. There's ways to make money out of it. But as I said, it completely ignores the other side of it in terms of, you know, you can talk about ESG and how it's great and, um, you know, in reality, I think it's probably at the moment more greenwashing than actually useful, but, you know, but you don't talk about investments in, you know, in, in the fossil fuel industry, which is still there, you know, so it's really that kind of, um, and the second important point is, I think, is always to look at who gets the benefits of these ones, like who is going to benefit from these opportunities, um, because we could end up in a world where, you know, we have switched completely to low carbon sources, um, and, you know, but now you're just paying your high energy bills to the profits of big multinational renewable energy companies while using a solar powered food bank, you know, like 
is that the, is that the future we want to go down? I think that's a kind of more complicated question we have to start asking. Thank you very much. Who gets the benefit? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lucas. Nick, over to you. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a rare sight, a consultant without PowerPoint, riding bareback today. So, yeah, thank you very much for having me um, at that short notice. And, um, yeah, I'd just like to respond to Lucas's paper um, with some, um, some of my own thoughts. So, really, yeah, to grow or not to grow, that's the question. So I think Lucas has very ably set up the challenges of shifting away from GDP-driven linear growth. We decarbonize production, but produce more and we consume more, so it doesn't solve the problem. More resources, more waste, a cycle of endless pursuit of more GDP. And Kate Rayworth lays out some of the reasons why GDP is something we might not want to do. For example, GDP fails to take account of non-monetized goods and services, the caring economy, Unpaid carers provide no contribution to national wealth, apparently. Now, anyone who knows an unpaid carer or has a mother will be clear that this is nonsense. Ecosystems are natural assets. Fresh air has no value in GDP. And in simple terms, why protect something that has no value? Public goods, in the sense of the added value provided by paid labor in critical situations, a heart operation, for example, it's not valued. And GDP also ignores assets or debts. So we can sell off the family silver if it adds to our bottom line. And that's fine until our external supplies of goods and services become scarce. And for example, the impact of the invasion of Ukraine on energy prices has brought that into sharp focus. So the GDP approach exposes us in terms of resilience. And critically, as a measure of GDP is, is a very blunt instrument. I mean, it operates at national level, or it's averaged across the entire working population, and it ignores inequality. And, and that's really critical, particularly when we're entering this argument. So you'll no doubt be aware that one measure of equality is the Gini coefficient, um, which measures inequality versus GDP per capita. And the coefficient returns a value between naught and one, where naught is perfect equality, and one is where one person holds all the wealth in a system. And the UK Gini coefficient for income is about 0.344, which is high in a European context. I think we're about the same as Nigeria. And it's also become much more unequal over the last four years, 40 years. Um, it was 0.275 in 1982. So unsurprisingly, England is more unequal than Wales partly because it has a higher proportion of extremely wealthy people. Um, and in terms of wealth, ONS calculated that in 2016, the richest 10% of, 10 of households in the UK held 44% of the wealth. So we've got a very unequal society. So one other thing, and again, Lucas touched on it, GDP is not directly linked to personal well-being. So while, for example, in the mid-1990s, well-being increased in line with GDP growth in Norway, in neighboring Sweden, well-being fell as GDP grew. So there's no linkage there that we get happier as we become more profitable. So the disparity between GDP and well-being has led to innovations such as the famous Gross National Happiness Index in Bhutan. So in 1972, the fourth king of Bhutan declared that gross national happiness is more important than gross domestic product. And he commissioned a framework with nine dimensions of happiness that few would dis disagree with. And I just want to read these out because maybe if we just reflect on the UK today and consider where pursuit of GDP has led us and how well we're performing in these areas. So these are the nine dimensions. Psychological well-being, health, education, time use, cultural diversity and resilience, good governance, community vitality, ecological diversity and resilience, living standards. I rest my case. <clears throat> so I think it's fair to say that GDP has some severe flaws 
and that Wales experiences significant inequality. So, to go back to the discussion, the post-growth perspective acknowledges that limiting GDP growth can adversely affect the poorest in society, potentially exacerbating that inequality that we already have in our system. So, this gives us a tension between saving the planet and supporting our most vulnerable citizens, as Luke has referred to. So, what are the options? Um, I mean, if we accept that GDP growth is dead, which I hope we do, then green growth can offer a potential shift. But ultimately, it still relies on resource use, and it does nothing to address the growth of consumption. So I would kind of compare it to the role of offsets on the path to net zero. It might be a kind of a necessary evil to get to where we want to be. Or you could call it a sugar rush. If we focus on inputs rather than outputs, though, it should be possible to grow value through the more efficient use of the resources we have and to grow value by retaining that value here in Wales. And that's where the circular economy comes in. So <clears throat> what do we mean by circular economy? So Alan MacArthur describes circular economy as a shift from a linear process of extracting materials, making products, and throwing them away to a circular approach where we stop waste being pr produced in the first place. And it's based on three principles, and I'm sure you're all aware of these, but I'll say them anyway. So three principles, eliminating waste and pollution, circulating products and materials at the highest possible value, and regenerating nature. So let's start with waste. And on the face of it, Wales has got a pretty good record. Now, I know it's been brought up earlier. Um, we're kind of world leaders in recycling with number three. We've gone from recycling 5% of our domestic waste in 1999 to 65% in 2021. And as a nation, we love recycling. We abs we're absolutely in love with recycling. But now we need to learn the next stage. We need to move up the ladder, move up from recycling to repair and reuse. And this is the second point. When you're done with something, sell it to someone else who can reuse it as it is. If it's broken, try and repair it, maybe using one of the excellent repair cafes across the network in Wales. So, um, Levi's, for example, as an example of a corporate, Levi's say that longevity and circularity is at the core of their business thinking. And in the UK, they've now got tailors who mend and alter jeans, and they offer discounts in return for customers trading in denims of any brand and colour, which they then repurpose. Now, I think that's interesting because that's a big corporate. It's a brand I wouldn't normally buy because I wouldn't see them as cool enough, um, and they're doing that kind of thing. So that's where we are in terms of repair. So if it can't be fixed, try and rep repurpose the bits for spares or for remanufacture. And then finally, if all else fails, use it for raw materials. Now, in my business, we've got a project at the moment with Greenstream Flooring based in Porth and the Ronda. It's a social enterprise, and Greenstream last year reused or recycled 60,000 square meters of carpet tiles, most of which would previously have gone to landfill. And they provide affordable flooring to households who need it, including refugees. They train volunteers, they deliver substantial carbon savings. We're trying to work with them, in fact, to try and monetize their carbon savings and offer those as social impact offsets to fund more good work. So a circular economy approach can replace linear extractive models with regenerative practice cradle to cradle instead of cradle to grave, as resources are looped back as a feedstock for further sale, repair, or repurposing. This reduces waste, and it maximizes economic and environmental value. So this is not about consumers and businesses having some kind of collective Damascene conversion to becoming eco-warriors. It's about a paradigm shift in our economic model. So what are the implications for industry? A circular approach needs a totally different approach to design, manufacture, distribution, and retail. It affects the whole supply chain. It changes all our thinking. So if producers understand that they will get their products back one day for repair or repurposing, they start to think differently. And we've seen evidence here in terms of the responsible fashion trade. So brands such as Finisterre and Patagonia, Wales' own Hyatt Denim, all offer repair services. Some re offer resale shops. Uh, they're starting to understand they want to see their clothes back, and they want them to last as long as possible. So typically, alongside this is a shift from product to service. So again, somebody else we're working with at the moment is River Simple, who are making hydrogen cars in Paris. And they're looking at a subscription model where users, drivers become users, 
pay a single monthly fee plus a mileage rate to use the car, and that payment covers all aspects of the car, including the fuel. So the implication for River Simple is that they now have the incentive to make the car as fuel efficient as possible because they're going to pay the fuel bills themselves and they want to save those costs. Not only that, they buy parts for their quality and longevity as they want to minimize the lifetime cost, not maximize the profit on sales. So going even further, they're exploring servitization of their supply chain. So as they're actually leasing the components for the cars they're building from the manufacturers who make them, so the supply chain itself has an interest in the overall quality and lifetime cost of the end product. And that has profound implications for the way they work. And we're seeing that elsewhere. So, for example, Rolls-Royce Aero engines, which I think are serviced in Nangaru, um, are trying to achieve zero waste to landfill. And their engines are leased to users on a total care package. So Rolls-Royce retained responsibility for engine performance and payment is charged on a power by the hour system based on flying hours. So again, they've got a stake in making sure that these things are efficient. Another example, office chairs. I'd always hated office chairs. I don't know if anybody else experiences this. But we used to buy ours from a well-known online office supplies company. And they came loose, they fell apart, they wobbled, they failed. I hated the blue color. They always came with blue. There was nothing to do with them when they were done except throw them out. And then back in 2008, I was lucky enough to hear Michael Browngart at the first Do Lectures in Cardigan, and he was talking about cradle to cradle. And this was probably my first experience of the idea of technical and biological nutrients being endlessly recycled through a system. And I was fascinated. And shortly afterwards, I saw that Welsh manufacturers Orange Box had produced the first cradle to cradle accredited office chair, perfectly recyclable and repairable. They were really expensive, but we managed to get a deal on some second-hand ones and we still have them 40 years later. And actually, one did break, and the guys send out an engineer to mend it. I love that. I absolutely love that. So when businesses know they may get their products back, they make better products that last longer, ultimately using fewer resources, lowering costs, and retaining value. Critically, they also build a relationship with their customers, and they're able to build brand loyalty and community. And that can bring about behavior change. So, Different models of ownership really have an impact on consumers. At the moment, we love owning stuff, and we need to go beyond recycling and stop buying so much stuff. We need to reduce. And when we take the ownership element away from some of our key goods, the relationship with the user changes. If you get away from the sunk cost of owning your personal car and shift to a zip car model, where you access a car when you need it and then forget it, your behavior changes. Once every journey is visibly pay per trip, driving becomes more comparable with public transport. Car use reduces, active travel increases, the climate benefits and community benefits. If we had a library of things on every corner, we wouldn't need to own a power drill or a wallpaper stripper, so we could reduce the demand for stuff. So how do we make all this happen? So if we're serious about tackling climate change through economic policy, It'll take really bold leadership to make things work in favor of circular activity. And a circular economy offers great opportunity for employment, as it's more labor intensive than a throwaway society. It offers huge scope for innovation in products and services, from reclaiming raw materials to developing efficient blockchain traceability systems for supply chain management. It can support a post-growth economy through maximizing value, lowering costs, and building resilience. And embedding circular thinking can be applied to other areas of the economy and society. If we're, if we're investing in preventative maintenance to maximize asset life, we could even apply the same thinking to healthcare and invest seriously in preventative medicine in community, for example. Hence, we need to make a circular approach the default position for economy and society. So in terms of barriers and like what gets in the way and what can governments do, I think there's a few things where areas could be looked at. Primary one, procurement, particularly in the public sector. And you know, if we can get to grips with purchasing on the basis of, life, basis of lifetime cost or carbon cost, we can transform the impact of public purchasing. Meat, the most economically advantageous tender, has to go. Company legislation. My company, Miller Research, is a B Corp. So we've legally changed our articles to allow us to benefit people and planet, not shareholders. And although gradually changing under investor pressure, shareholder profit 
has consistently stood in the, pro in the way of the progress of decarbonisation. So company legislation important. Taxation. What if businesses were taxed on the use of raw materials rather than profit? Fresh inputs would be minimised, circular behaviour incentivised. We have some colleagues at uh, an outfit called Copper 8 in Amsterdam who worked this through for the construction sector for the Dutch government. And the results were broadly revenue neutral for kind of reasonable performers in the sector while saving significant material resource. Innovation and innovate, um, investment in innovation and novel product design. Welsh government's already invested a billion pounds in recycling infrastructure, but that investment is really bringing rewards. We need to do research into green tape. We hear a lot about red tape. Let's find out what the green tape barriers are to actually delivering some stuff on a decarbonised economy. Identify regulatory barriers to change and deal with them. We need to look at new approaches to finance, including public-private partnerships, and then we need to extend that model to community partnerships as well. And social support. We brought up inequality. We know that decarbonisation can affect the most vulnerable in society the most, so we need to have something like a universal basic income to ensure that the poorest in society are not adversely affected by the changes we're going to see. And above all, a circular post-growth economy is going to rely on collective effort to recognise the benefits of behaving differently and embracing change. And if we can achieve that, a circular approach can support green growth or post-growth in, green growth in the short term, post-growth for the long haul, and deliver a better Wales. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Nick. That was a, an extraordinary canter <laughs> through all the things that we need to do. Um, just, it just struck me while, while while you were talking that, I mean, when I was a minister in 2008, um, uh, I was advocating River Simple and Orange Box, and here we are in 2022, yeah. and they're still at the forefront. Yes. In a sense. So there is a real challenge about the fact that people who were in the forefront of 2008 are still at the forefront in 2022 when we need to really accelerate activity. So it struck me that maybe there's another route um, that we might need to think about. And recently, some of you know that Danone lost its chief executive because he was so focused on environmental and social governance. And shareholder activism took him out because they wanted the financial return today rather than responsibility tomorrow. Can we use shareholder activism <laughs> to encourage a circular economy? Can we really think about all those people in Wales who are on the boards of small companies who could potentially drive completely different kinds of change. Yeah, absolutely, and that would be so good to see. And perhaps we need some mechanism for mobilizing that power. I mean, we've seen amazing shareholder power in Australia, for example, buying coal mines and shutting them down. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's, there's lots could be done there. I mean, obviously I'd, I'd encourage other people to go through the B Corp process because at the moment, I, I don't know how many people are aware that, you know, as, as a company in the UK, you have a legal obligation to maximise returns to shareholders. That's absurd. Absolutely absurd. And, you know, we, we, we saw it not in terms of finance, but the P&O crisis when workers were sacked because there had to be a maximum return to shareholders. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's kind of, you know, 1980s thinking, and we need to get away from that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, the really, two really hard acts to follow, and I'm tempted just to stir up, tear up my notes, and start afresh. But I think I'll, I'll try and stick to the script. Um, Mark Linus, who um, you've heard us speak about quite a lot, has written a really good and thought-provoking think piece for us um, from the eco-modernist perspective. And if you haven't already, I'd urge you to take a look at that. Um, Lucas has already um, presented some really strong arguments against it. Um, so I'm going to step back a little bit for us and outline a bit of Mark's argument um, to prompt the discussion and then supplement it with some of my views for the next few minutes. 
So the eco-modernist perspective argues that there are no fixed limits to growth, and the arguments against growth, it says, um, emphasize the biophysical limits of the earth and how perpetual growth has got to transgress these. Um, Eco-modernists recognize that the earth does have limits to human interference, um, such as climate biodiversity and the nitrogen cycle, etc. But it argues that growth also depends on technology, population growth, and consumption, which growth, yes, that seems, seems fair enough. And Mark points out that Wales can enjoy sustainable growth, which promotes innovation and job creation. And a big part of this, he acknowledges, is moving towards greater equality and a just transition focusing on deprived communities and also reflecting the really important principles of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, um, focusing on climate stabilisation, environmental recovery, recovery and respect for planetary limits. And a key issue here is how humanity interacts with planetary boundaries through technological change. And in his piece, he acknowledges that planetary boundaries, many have been transgressed, the ones that were identified in 2009, sadly. So climate biodiversity, land systems change, toxic chemicals, water use, pollution, just to name a few. But he also argues that energy supply is not limited, and we've got access to solar, wind, and nuclear. And technology, very importantly, has got the potential to mitigate these challenges, even if we don't yet know the answers. So that's the key, the key aspect here. And it could allow for economic growth to continue, which could be exciting, although I'll return to what we mean by economic growth. And technology can therefore be a driver of further growth. So one example of this is the phasing out of CFCs and replacing them with less harmful alternatives. So I find the idea that technological change can overcome many of the planetary limits a really interesting one, but I've also got lots of concerns around this and the emphasis it places on technology um, and some of the challenges that were discussed I've heard in the Energy Network session, and also how we can achieve the technological change when we face some of the really challenging political realities and the incentives that we're all operating within, as Lucas has been mentioning. So I think we need to go further than this. And I think we need to do more quicker and to think differently. And I, from what I've heard, I don't think any of you would necessarily disagree with that. Um, and there is a risk that if we continue not being able to change, well, we continue not being able to change if we don't address the current power balances that are preventing change, as we've been discussing. And I think it's really important that we, we ask why we need growth, what sort of growth we need, and we need, a, we need a new sort of growth that is sustainable. So growth along with equality and environmental sustainability. And of course, there are tensions between these when we refer to the current definitions that we're using. And that makes it a really difficult task. So I think we need three things. Firstly, we need investment in technology and infrastructure, which is a no-brainer, particularly to all of you in, here in the room today. And that will help us to address the supply side constraints and to move towards the net zero outcome that we want. And we're already in the transition. I think I've, I've been talking about us being in the transition, um, moving towards the net zero transition, but of course we're in it. And Chris Skidmore's um, independent review into net zero highlighted this. And to quote, infrastructure is the key that will unlock net zero, and we need to rapidly build and adapt the infrastructure for electricity, hydrogen, etc. he goes on. And so there's a great potential for Wales to play to its comparative advantage and continue to develop technologies where it can be world leading. The second point I'd argue, which is difficult using our current definitions and the current language, is we need productivity growth to maintain wages and our standards of living. And Without increased productivity, we're facing declining real wages. And particularly, we see this in the current high inflation environment. We've already experienced a lot of deindustrialization in the South Wales Valleys, with the result that there's been fractured communities, poverty, loss of livelihoods, and poor health. And people flourish when they're in well paid jobs that give them purpose, and their skills are valued by society. However, a important caveat to this, 
Of course, the circular economy is critical, and we need a different measure of productivity, because I think that's the current block that we're facing. And really important here, of course, is equality and diversity, because arguably, yes, productivity growth is all fine, but we can achieve higher productivity growth by getting rid of the lower paid jobs, and then we've got higher productivity growth. But actually, that's not really what we're talking about. Here, we're talking about equality and diversity, which are critical to enable the sort of future society that I think we're talking about and we all want to see. And this requires a change in the workforce throughout. And without this, I don't think we'll be able to achieve net zero. So I think to achieve these things, we need to reframe growth. And I think we need to look for, as Lucas was outlining, measures that look beyond GDP. And it's a real challenge at the moment because we are, and I agree, Lucas, facing the need to redesign the economy because we're, and businesses are responding to those incentives, the, the need for shareholder return, etc. And um, Cardiff Capital Region, the city deal, is facing some of those incentives because its targets are GBA uplift and job creation. Um, so right there, you see that's, that's how they meet their targets. They're responding to those incentives. And the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is a critical pillar within this, bringing together growth, prosperity, equality, and sustainability in its seven goals. Returning to the future technology aspect, we don't know what we don't know, and that's part of the challenge and also part of the solution. There's, we're, I think we're in a really exciting and challenging moment at the moment because there's the technological revolution that we need to see and in the net zero skills session we heard the Welsh government say that they're they're keen to Emma let's say that they're keen to hear what businesses need in terms of future technology to be able to respond to that and there is a chicken and egg situation because businesses and private sector is keen to hear the government's position as well so it is a case of all the different parties working together and having leadership to frame that discussion is really important. So it's a challenging moment now, but it is also present it, preventing, presenting opportunities because it's reshaping the discussion, changing the narrative, changing the language that we're using. But at the moment, we're still, of course, in that position where we're responding to the incentives that we're being faced. So how do we make that shift? And I think there are... Um, examples that we've seen where the change has been demanded from the grassroots and I think that is a big way where I would hope to see that change happening and a shift in the language and the incentives because those who are against that change happening I probably don't have any choice but to respond to it. I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, I'm also going to go back to the future for, for the question I want to ask you. I mean, just as uh, River Semple um, and Orange Box were around in 2008, also the idea of carbon capture and storage was around in 2008. And I remember as minister with responsibility for energy and climate, putting money aside for carbon capture and storage, which still has not achieved in any way what we'd like to see it achieve. So in the context of an argument, I know obviously Mark's not here to put the argument, but in the context of an argument that says technology will save us, which aspect of technology do you think is most realistic in the context of an opportunity that could be adopted? Gosh, thanks Jane, that's a really big question. <laughs> and I'm... Uh not being an expert on eco-modernism or technology, I would, I would say that actually I wouldn't, I'll slightly dodge the question a little bit if I may and say, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think the answer to that actually, I think anything can be achieved, any technological advances can be achieved if the incentives and the drivers are there. So I'll shift us to, the, to actually ask what is driving forward the change? What are the incentives, what are the political dimensions that underlie the push to make the change happen. And I think if there's sufficient desire and incentives to invest in technological development for whatever area, then I think the money 
would be allocated and we would see that investment and hopefully see the results. So I think the technologies have the potential to be developed and to be implemented, but I would question what the incentives and the drivers are there, um, what those are and how they need to shift. But I'd also be keen to hear from the people who do know about the technologies, perhaps in response to that. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much. Still learning how to manipulate these things that I think half the audience wears all the time. <laughs> so, but so I can see you um, for this question session. I'm just going to start out off with one question to the whole panel, because I think that point about incentives and drivers is a really interesting one. So if you, if each of you, I'm going to start with Nick because he's <laughs> based here in Wales before I go to Lucas, um, and then Helen. If you had to think immediately about the opportunity for incentives and drivers here in Wales to help us uh, look at growth, degrowth, and a circular economy, what would be the first thing that comes to mind in terms of the things we have to look at? So I'll come to all three of you on that, but I'll start with Nick. Uh, so, I don't know about incentives. Would enablers do as well as incentives? Well, enablers, yes, I think we can, we can be loose with this language. I, I mean, I, I, I think I agree that technology is not the answer. Um, and I think one of the things we need to do is have better conversations. Um, and I can't, I can't count the number of situations I've been in over the past couple of years where there's been a really intense conversation about decarbonisation and people have hit their the limits of their system and said, well, we need to have conversations with these people over here. And those conversations don't seem to happen. So I think a kind of nationwide program of brokerage to make conversations happen across the system um, would start to enable things probably better than financial incentives in a way. Thank you. Lucas. Um, yeah, very tricky question, I think. I think hearing talk about incentives and stuff, I think one of the key challenges, if we actually want to do this, is that it's fundamentally about a shift in power and who makes decisions, and in terms of democratizing the economy. And I think that is something which is really important um, and not happening enough. Like, I think if you look at Scotland, it's very interesting because Scotland, um, implemented the Future Generations Commissions. We've had it for a few years now. They've also run a citizens' assembly on climate. Um, both of them have come up with some really sensible, really good recommendations, really interesting stuff, quite radical as well. Incidentally, including you know, replacing GDP with a different measure of progress. The Scottish government um, this week, or maybe last week, published its new energy strategy and basically ignored recommendations from both the Citizens Assembly and the, the Just Transition Commission, and they both, you know, wrote like angry letters saying, "Why are you not doing what we're telling you to do?" And so I think building that accountability and that, and and really, from my it's like if you give that space for discussion, if you give that space for um, people to have these conversations, they come up with very sensible things and very possible things, and you just need to build in the systems to actually, you know, make it happen. Thanks very much. So conversations that meet, mean something, a nationwide program of brokerage, democratizing the economy, using mechanisms such as citizens' uh, uh, assemblies, uh, a commission. I know, I mean, actually Scotland's looking at its own version of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act at the moment because I've been in discussion with Scottish ministers. Helen, what about you? Yeah, I'd add something. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I agree with all of those points, and to those I would add, um, developing the skills to enable the implementation of the conversations. Um, and I think the advantage that Wales has got is that, as is often said, that it's a small country that has got the momentum and the drive and the um, enthusiasm to do things differently. And I think there's a great opportunity to 
develop the networks because it's often it's picked up in the literature as well that some of the networks are not as strong as they could be. Um, so to develop those networks and associated skills, so that builds on the conversation aspect, um, but the, the soft skills to take that forward. Thank you. And what's interesting is, of course, is that actually the things we want to change um, are, are part of a traditional economy, traditional ways of making money, traditional ways of, uh, of putting wealth, often into the hands of very few. And yet what we're needing to do is upend that. So our three experts are actually talking about um, new kinds of approaches which actually wouldn't just work in this field, but would work in health, would work in nature, a circularity of approach that could take us across the board. What about you? What questions or comments do you have? I'll, I'll, take, I'll take three at a time, and there's a microphone coming so that it can feed into those people who are listening online. And very warm welcome to you, by the way. Yeah, thanks very much for, the, <coughs> excuse me, thanks very much for three great presentations. Um, I'm thinking about housing, and thinking what actually we want in housing is thermal comfort. And co I compare housing issues and challenges to hospital. You have people with chronic diseases and people with acute disease. The chronic disease is the insulation and air leakage. The acute disease is the boiler fails. How do we address those issues? Because I see heat pumps, and people will hate me in this room for saying this, as the next big mis-selling scandal because we don't have the housing stock to respond, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> the, I would have asked you to do that if you may, just if, you, if you're happy to do that. Um, Mark Gale, I'm a farmer, but I did a sustainability degree and co-own uh, about 60 megawatts of community energy. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Nigel Pugh, campaigns lead, Coed Caddy, the Woodland Trust in Wales. Um, is it important uh, that the general public have a far greater understanding of a well-being economy and how it will better their lives uh, so that our leaders feel a lot more accountable to the policies of a well-being economy. Hi, uh, Tanya Nash, uh, uh, founder of uh, Future Clarity, a micro-business coaching facilitating sustainability sector and lead for the Women in Sustainability Network in Wales, which is a professional um, network for women working in the sustainability sector. That's what it says on the tin, really. Um, a little plug for our, our, our book club, uh, Doers and Improvers, it's reading Citizens, um, Why the Key to Fixing Everything is, a, is All of Us, um, which I think really speaks to what you've been talking about. Um, and, and this question about shifting from a consumer story into a citizen story. And, I, uh, and the question I have really is, how important is it for us to start talking about well-being of citizens for the collective ahead of and above of those of the individual, which is a sort of consumer story that we're, we're embedded in at the moment? Um, thanks very much. So three, three housing, uh, the three, three questions, one around uh, housing and the broader benefits, one around the public understanding, and, and what, one about the in integration or the interrelationship between the individual and society collectively. Um, Nigel. <laughs> sorry? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Nick, Nigel. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I was going to give a kind of amateur response on heat pumps, actually, um, partly because we were involved in the evaluation of the last Arbed scheme, um, which was still putting gas boilers into houses um, and was schizophrenic in terms of was it a decarbonisation programme or a fuel poverty programme? And, and it's quite interesting. There's, there's still a tension between those two, I, th I think, in Wales. And I think what we learned from that was that was quite a bold attempt at a place-based scheme, an area-based scheme, to identify using existing housing stats and local knowledge areas where you could take an approach where you could start to look at a collective scheme across a number of houses. And the problems, as you point out, were that installing heat pumps doesn't really work unless you've got a whole package around it. 
So it needs PV with it, it needs insulation with it, it probably needs new windows and doors, and the housing stock, you know, possibly external insulation as well. And so it's quite challenging to know whether you go narrow and deep on those interventions or you go broad and shallow. And I think it's the latter approach that's probably been taken. And really, in terms of the economic impact of that scheme, I think you probably could have funded three community wind turbines and had a bigger, bigger impact overall. So I think in terms of our existing housing stock, it's a massive challenge. And I think there's an even bigger challenge that hasn't been tapped into, which is that of the private rented sector. Um, because at the moment, we've had programs for social housing, we've had programs for owner occupiers, but there's a huge number of people, particularly in the valleys, living in private rented sector housing, which is just scraping over the quality threshold. Um, and they're, they're, they're ripe for improvement, but there's no incentive for the landlord because they're not going to get any more rent. There's no incentive for the tenant because the landlord's not, not going to let them do it without putting the rent up. And that needs public sector intervention, in my view. Um, so I think there's a number of issues there. But yeah, I mean, heat pumps, it's not going to be a silver bullet for a lot of our housing stock in Wales. And that's before you get near the rural sector. Um, Nick, can I just ask you, because in terms of looking at opportunity, I mean, the, the trouble is we're in a situation at the moment where I think probably every single graph is going in the wrong direction or every single chart. And therefore, it's very easy to articulate the problems. But in a sense, taking that question that you asked about, you know, narrow and deep versus broad and shallow that if you were going to do something about housing now in the context of growth, degrowth, um, and a circular economy, what do you think would be the best intervention? In the housing sector? Or kind of... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, there was one pretty successful intervention, which was fit tariffs, um, because it levered a lot of private sector individual investment in putting solar panels on lots of roofs. Um, so I think that's a possibility. We're not going to get one solution that fits all. We can legislate for new build. Um, we can build our social housing sector um, where there's a willingness to build in good practice. I mean, I guess we can legislate for the private sector, but I know developers will kick back. You know, we need more housing, but developers will push back if we up standards in terms of um, re you know, installation of renewables as part of that. So we need to be bold there. In terms of retrofit, it's a real challenge. I don't know what the answer is. Okay. Um, and I would, of the other two, want to say anything on the housing front? Um, I think, yeah, I'm not going to go into the whole the heat pump and the details, but I think the interesting question for me is, you know, we heard it this morning, like insulation, heat pumps like upgrading the housing stock is very much a win-win-win situation you know you can reduce food poverty you can reduce health impacts you can reduce carbon it's going to improve quality of life so so why is it not happening like we've known that for 20 years why do we not have a massive insulation program like the government found billions of pounds to put into tests and trays during the coronavirus pandemic why has it not done something similar for upgrading housing you know and the question then where it comes down to, I think, um, and that actually leads me into the other two questions, so if, um, if, if I may, is that this is around the bigger story, so I think it is important, obviously I would say that, that we have a better understanding of a well-being economy throughout the um, public, we're working on that, um, and, but I think a big part of that is changing that narrative, changing that frame from exactly as was mentioned, from a kind of more individual to a more collective collective thing because I think overall if we want to pull this off in terms of not just the housing stock but other things we're going to need stronger government regulation doesn't mean the government has to deliver everything we need the public sector we need the private sector we need the third sector um, but we're going to need much stronger rules and directions and public investment as well I think we need a bigger shift and whether that's funded through borrowing through money creation or through taxing wealth or like higher you know the money is, is there so ironically I think there's actually this bit that as a post-growth person I'm accused of talking about limits all the time 
but actually what I'm saying is we can do it, you know? Like, it's, well, when you look, look at these things, you're all the t actually being told by more conventional economists all the time, no, there's no money, you can't do this, you know, like, well, yeah, so I just think that's slightly ironic. Okay, thanks. Um, Helen, do you want to, to pick up either on um, um, public understanding or that relationship between the individual and collective approach? Yeah, and um, I'd like to also um, come back to the incentives point again, if I may. I'm stand, sounding a bit like a stock record. But, um, and, uh, yeah, other than to agree, I think there is a, a real need to change the narrative and the language. And to, part of that is encouraging the behavior change that's needed as well. And I think returning to the idea of changing taxation, as you mentioned, Nick, um, I think that's a really interesting one because, and to ask the question of why that hasn't been done yet and what could happen in order to make that leap and to change the tax structure to then shift the incentives. Um, and I think if there's enough political pressure, then, then those things can happen. But I think it, before those things happen, before those bigger shifts happen, just talking about things differently um, is a good start. And that starts to reframe the understanding of the concepts and the ideas and what can be done. Thank you. Um, can we have some more questions, please? Right, OK. Uh, a person with the mic, please just choose three people. <laughs> we'll do another. We'll try and get another three in as well. So if you have a question to a particular person, please name that person, and then we can, we can get through two sets of questions. Yeah. Thank I you. I don't actually have that, but um, hopefully someone will want to uh, respond. Um, so I'm Dan Thorman from the CAST Centre um, at Cardiff University. So we look at climate change and social transformations. Um, yeah, really interested in um, lots of the responses and uh, just to kind of respond to the point there from Helen about changing the language um, and changing the narrative, even the way that we've framed a lot of the responses here, these words like incentives or opportunities are quite neoliberal, individualist, development, development focused. Um, so I would kind of question how we... Um, how we approach what, what we're looking to do. And I think some of the things that Lucas was saying might uh, um, offer opportunity for that. Uh, I also wanted to, sorry, just to, to say that if, if the 1.5 degrees um, of global warming now is potentially um, shot, that we might have to um, move, move away from that and that, that technology might not be able to solve these problems, um, that we accept that lifestyle change is needed. How, if we're using this language still about green growth that might just maintain the status quo, um, how can we actually expect individuals and uh, public engagement to move on beyond that if we're still looking to kind of maintain what we have and the goals that we have as society? Uh, thank, thank you very much. A really, really important question about how, how we get people to understand the challenge in front of them. Hi, um, I'm Darren Robinson from Sheffield Uni. Um, before I ask my question, I'd just like to say how nice it is to see this kind of conversation taking place on the main stage for a change. It's, um, yeah, it's been very nice. Um, so my question, um, such as it is, is that, um, well, I'm not an economist, but I understand that income is preto distributed where you've got the wealthiest at the left and the least wealthy on the right. I think quite a lot of the discussion has been about you know, how we tackle the left part of that distribution with the sort of Robin Hood style strategies. But I think we also need to think about, you know, the people at the lowest incomes and how we can achieve social mobility, um, particularly the under 25s in the most deprived areas. And I just wonder if, um, if the panel has ideas around that, perhaps through skills training, but very targeted, I guess. Thank you, because they're going to be brief ideas. And, uh, <laughs> and one more from this, this round, please. Okay. Uh, Malcolm Davis, uh, Welsh Government. I work on the Optimised Retrofit Programme. Um, so just as an awareness, we are looking at housing decarbonisation. Uh, Optimised Retrofit is working with the registered social landlords, 11 local authorities, 230,000 social housing in Wales. Um, some really exciting, contemporary, and also learning from where we've come from projects. Ethel Street in Cardiff, go and have a look. That's TAF Housing. They're using a very innovative new old technology to deal with damp but it's about ventilation insulation it's not just insulation and cooling and what is best for the building 
and not forgetting it's someone's home. So we work very much with, with the social landlords to understand it's someone's home. Optimised Retrofit is also working with Leasing Scheme Wales. There's 15 local authorities sat on that, and that is working with private rental sector. And also it forms part of the learning and the future delivery of the Welsh Housing Quality Standard. So we're doing quite a lot. And from what I hear from contacts across the UK, we're being watched because some very exciting stuff. People can learn from us. And thank you, thank you so much. And will you be here for the rest of the afternoon? So you spotted him, the housing people. <laughs> One thing is about skills. We're working very closely with Trustmark, because to undertake all this, you need trust. And yeah. if you don't know what Trustmark is, have a look. If you've got your own house and you want work done, that is a verification program which means if anything goes wrong, there is legal and financial recourse. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, panel, um, comments on the, on the first two questions? Helen? Um, coming on, on Darren's point about um, low income and social mobility, um, absolutely, um, skills training, I think, is, is a key aspect of this. Um, and we had the, the previous session on um, skills and the need to um, upskill, reskill people within the labour market, um, but also to ensure that there is equality as that's undertaken and looking at removing the barriers to people engaging with um, becoming reskilled so they can actually um, increase um, basic qualifications and lifelong learning apprenticeships and the new um, Commission for Educational, um, Commission for Tertiary Education and Research um, I'm hoping that that will be a key part of that in bringing together the different actors to really enable that coordination and put the things in place within the educational system that need to, to help to make this happen because I think it's, it's a lot of these different facets coming together to respond to the problem. Thank you. Um, brief comments because we want to get one more round of questions in if we may. I think actually maybe slightly more provocative. I agree with what Helen said, but I think I, and again, in terms of the framing, I think we don't need social mobility, we need fair wages at the bottom, and we need a proper valuing of these jobs. Like a lot of these people in those deprived areas are doing really important jobs in care, in, um, you know, like in, in other areas, like we have seen during the pandemic, we had a list of essential workers. If you look at what they're being paid, you know, like, because our economic system doesn't value a lot of the things that are actually the most important ones. And I think that is, needs to be part of that conversation. I, I, I think there's kind of an elephant in the room as well with that, in the sense that if we're going to help those at the lower end, we also need to redistribute from the upper end as well. And when 10% of people own 44% of the wealth, I think there's a need for some redistribution there. Yeah. Okay, there were some more, I think we can get one more quick round, but please, just a very quick question. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm James Lewis from Erlab. One thing that I find quite frustrating is that we often have very visionary world-leading policy, and then up here, and then here we have really interesting, exciting pilot programs but we seem to lack the ability or the, the intent to collectively build on those pilot programs and intentionally quickly learn and develop to take us to the aims in the aspirational policy. So how do we build a collective rapid learning environment, including around building collective rapid learning environments? If that makes sense. The question, I share your pain on this one. <laughs> At the front here as well, please. Uh, hello everyone, Philippo Spreiru, uh, Senior Election Global Political Economy at University of South Wales. First of all, thank you very much and I very much endorse a conversation on post-growth. Growth is a taboo around the world. People and uh, politicians don't want to touch upon it. Uh, growth was basically an imperative that was cultivated during the previous century amid geopolitical controversy and great powers wish to grow their economies and their power. We are no more in this world. And I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, 
the post-growth literature, the ecological economics literature, you have referred to it immensely in your talks, has given us very, very many tools. You have referred to tax bads, not goods, and so on. So my question is the following. I think we have the tools to change our capitalism and our political and economic system. We don't. Is it because of the lobbying power of business, and especially in the wealth context, how easy is it to raise new taxes, for example, in the way that you suggested, so that we can spearhead this transition in the wealth context? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I always love a question like that when there's hardly any time. Um, we're going to take all the hands. Please, short questions, because they're only going to have a minute each to answer all of them. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, Gary Rawlings, MD, uh, Natame UK Limited, uh, from Kavili. Uh, my question is, uh, maybe uh, Alan can pick this up. Drivers and incentives, uh, decarbonization, there are answers out there today, if you open your eyes. And I believe, uh, Jane, coming up is the Welsh Clean Air Act. Um, there's between 24 and 26,000 people dying every year in this country, uh, not in actually Wales, but in the United Kingdom. And that's an incentive for this to be uh, the number one uh, objective for the Welsh government. Thank you. The back. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, so it's already coming up. The sort of challenge. Stan Townsend, by the way. Thank you. I work with Jane on the 2035 uh, group. Um, so it's a common thread how we sort of individualize uh, these sort of problems and see de growth, post growth as an individual. So question for the panel is: uh, I'm interested in what a sort of post growth or well being economy might mean for the sort of ways in which we live, i.e., how we share resources, live communally or maybe even, as Lucas alluded to, kind of decentralized decision-making and power? Uh, so that's my question. Thank you. And I think last question. Oh, no, two more. Yeah, it's one to Jen there, and then one to this uh, gentleman here in the third row. Hi, Jen Baxter, Deputy Chair of the National Infrastructure Commission for Wales. And this is really a question for Lucas and Helen. So I like both eco-modernism and degrowth together. Um, so how do you work to bring those two ideas closer together? And also, Helen, we've given half the story about eco-modernism. We haven't really talked about the natural side and the rewilding as well, which I think might be useful for everyone else. Thank you. And over to, over to this man in the third row. Thank you. Hi, uh, um, I'm Joe Thomas with Sustrans Cymru. This is very short. Um, what does the panel believe in a right to repair enshrined in law? Okay, right. Now this basically, each panelist, um, you, could, you can have two minutes <laughs> to answer the question that you feel you have a burning answer to, because we, we've clocked them. We've clocked the questions, and you are, through our work in the 2035 group, we're going to be trying to address all these issues. So, over to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say exactly the same. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. And, and, and I, I think it's one thing that um, eBay and internet suppliers have really helped, that we can actually get spares for a lot of stuff now that we couldn't before. Um, I think right to repair legislation, yeah, absolute sense. I know initially it's in terms of electronics. You know, could we broaden it out? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Helen? Yeah, I was going to um, agree with the right to repair. I think that would be, be fantastic. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> um, just to quickly pick up a couple of other points. Um, Jen, your points about land and rewilding, um, absolutely. I didn't give a comprehensive view of the eco-modernist argument, but I would point you to the session that's taking place after the coffee break that we'll be discussing that. Um, so do, do come along, quick plug for that session. Um, and Lucas, I might leave you to pick up the second part of Jen's question if you were planning to. Um, on um, business incentives, profit, um, and some of the challenges around making those changes, um, I would look to, um, and this is going to sound very critical of our current um, political setup, but I think it, we've been talking um, about, Lucas, you've mentioned the democratisation um, of 
and how that needs to change, but the funding of um, political parties and the links to, to business, for instance, which then I think those are fundamentally um, fundamental stumbling blocks to, to change. And it's the ingrained um, integration of business and politics that, that does present a block. And I think that's fundamentally something that needs to shift, which is very difficult and very challenging. Yeah, very, uh, well, we could talk a lot longer today, I think, and very, very good questions. I think I would pick up the one in terms of, yeah, hi, we have the tools, why is it not happening? Is it lobbying? I think, yes, I think the, the lobbying is a problem, but it's also the wider story and the wider narrative that gives that lobbying power, I think, is part of it. We mentioned that a few times today. Um, and. The path, and I think what is something which we haven't picked up enough in the post-growth literature, I think, is really what do you do with massive multinational corporations which have enormous amounts of power, no very little democratic accountability. Like, how do you reform those in a way like to, you know, really account for that power and make sure that that is not like um, used in terms of lobbying? And that is, I think, is interesting to look at how you democratize these kind of businesses and stuff. So. There's ideas about that out there. Um, how to reconcile ecomodernism and um, degrowth. I think, for me, it's a question of priorities. Like, let's set the priority at climate change, set the priority at like you know providing good lives for people while we decarbonize, and then use that as our really our measuring stick to look at all the different things, like which kind of technologies, because there are a lot of promising technologies in the eco-modernist eco in terms of rewilding as well. What, are, what kind of productivity do we want? Where does productivity does not make sense? And actually, maybe a slightly challenging response to the question about how we live. I think there's, in the degrowth especially, there's a lot about like localism, about community, that of stuff, which I think generally supportive, but I think there's not enough discussion where does that make sense and where does it not? Like, what kind of things do you want to scale down to the local level? What kind of things must, does it make sense to produce at larger scales um, or in different places and um, coming from these kind of priorities? Um, and I guess that's how I would reconcile it. Well, thank you. Thank you all three very much. I, I just want, in closing, to reflect on when I asked everybody the question um, in terms of what they do now, and of course it wasn't about the individual actions like insulate everything, it's about how we engage with people to have the discussions to enable people to support an agenda like this, how we bring people to the table. And I just think that in the context of the work that is going on here, the superb work going on in the Wales Centre for public policy in terms of the challenge. I've actually been rereading Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, and there is a direct um, challenge between mending and consuming. And it just features all the way throughout the book, mending and consuming, because if you mend, you're not consuming. And we want people to mend <laughs> and not consume. So that right to repair, things like the, it is a back to the future, agenda in terms of saying if we value something we look after it we keep it as long as possible we share it we engage collaboratively do things as 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 a community and that's i think nick's point about circularity that actually the point i think you made it to me when we were chatting earlier rather than in the audience just now but when you start thinking in a circular way you apply it to every part of your life so that actually, if you have stopped thinking in a linear way, then you see everything. And your point about the Clean Air Act, sir, is exactly in that context. You see the co-benefits of behaving differently. And that's a very, very important narrative for us. Probably my biggest um, hero in this space is Professor Donella Meadows, um, who led the team who wrote The First Limits to Growth. Um, back for the, for, for, for the first Earth Conference. Um, uh, and she, in fact, first limits to growth came out in 1972, so she was way ahead of governments and thought at the time that if you gave evidence to governments, they would act, because why would they not? Evidence is not enough. 
It has to be about those softer issues. It has to be about how you take people with you, how you learn, how you do tell truth to power. But essentially, you have to have enough love and care for the human race in nature in terms of taking this forward. And she talks about um, that if you... And we, if we think about taking actions as though the world has no limits, the result is collapse. If you're told there is a timeline against which you can take action and you extract everything you can, so even if you know there's limits, and I think this is probably where we are now, you know there's limits and you know there's a timeline, um, as a result, you extract as much as you can now. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the fossil fuel companies over the energy crisis. But if there is enough love, enough intelligence, enough care for us all to work to together for a better, more sustainable outcome, then that is the route to more success for the majority. And I was reflecting on that because while we're discussing this, of course, the World Economic Forum has been looking at the top 10 risks, um, both in the next couple of years and uh, over the next 10 years. And let me just give you the top four. In the next couple of years, you won't be surprised to find cost of living top. Number two, natural disasters and extreme weather events. Number three, uh, geoeconomic confrontation. Number four, failure to mitigate climate change, actually I'll go to number five, erosion of social cohesion and societal polarization. But the prediction, and this is governments together making this prediction, that actually in 10 years, if we don't act, failure to mitigate climate change will be the biggest risk facing the world. So actually, individually, collectively, we do all need to do things, but we particularly need to make governments move on such things because the second risk is the failure of climate change adaptation, and that's going to come to us all. And then natural disasters and extreme weather events, biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse, which will lead to large-scale involuntary migration, natural resource crises, and erosion of social cohesion. Within 10 years, or we act now. So thank you very much. And now I'm Sepaned. Tea break. <laughs> Thanks a lot.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, if you'd like to pick up your last cup of tea and a piece of cake and grab a seat. Also, it's a bit like an undergraduate lecture. Some people are going for the back seats. And because we've split the whole group into two, if you would wish, and I'm not going to force you, if you want to come a bit towards the front, then we can have a, an easier conversation. So. Um, there's loads of seats available at the front, Calvin, and others. <laughs> Calvin, that's a better position you're in than um, where you were in the last session. Okay, so welcome everybody to the penultimate session of the day. My name is James Down. I'm Director of Research at the Wales Centre for Public Policy. And my job in the next just under an hour is just to chair this session on land use. It's an interesting time to do a session like this with, with Brexit and changes to the common agricultural policy, open up different ways of um, delivering agricultural subsidies. And it's also a good time to talk about uh, rewilding. And there was a question in that in the last session. Unfortunately, one of our presenters today, um, Sophie, is unable to attend. Um, she, she's ill. Um, but we're hoping she's going to write a piece about her research which covers the rewilding issue. So there's three main aims of this session. So that is related to the conference's aim of how will Wales in 2050 differ from the Wales of today. This one is just going to focus about the use of land. So what we're going to try and do is have a conversation. We've got two expert speakers. They're going to have up to about 10 minutes each and then I saw in the last session there were more questions than the opportunity to have answers. So we're going to allow lots of time for questions. So if that's okay with everybody, I'm just going to introduce our first speaker. So that's Janet Dwyer, who is a professor of rural, po po rural policy at the Countryside and Community Research Institute at the University of Gloucester. She's an experienced agricultural economist working mostly on policy analysis for sustainable rural development covering farming, the rural environment, rural enterprise and communities. 
She's done lots of work in, in Wales and has done work for the, the Wales Centre for Public Policy too, so I'm delighted to invite her here today. So open it over to Janet. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the Wales Centre for Public Policy for inviting me to come today, because I've really enjoyed being here, and I've really learnt a lot this morning and um, taken a lot away from these discussions and debates. So, great. Thank you very much. Um, land use. I'd like to say land use and management, because I think the two things go together. Um, I just wanted to put in a few thoughts, really, to be a bit challenging and try and stimulate a bit of discussion. So for me, um, a title like land use is not just about trees, and it's not just about carbon sequestration. Um, anybody who works in rural land use and management understands that it's all about not just nature, but nature and culture, knowledge, and about whose knowledge is listened to and whose knowledge counts, and about multiple resources. Rural Wales, the land in rural Wales, can generate a huge range of resources that can be really important to us in the future as we move towards a net zero situation. And I think we shouldn't overlook that and we shouldn't oversimplify what we need to think about when we're looking ahead and thinking about land use. So um, climate change means moving away from dependence on fossil fuels. We got that message very clearly this morning. But that means multiple changes because fossil fuels underpin so much of the current economy and people's livelihoods. They underpin energy, obviously. They underpin a lot of materials, from everything from basic construction to domestic fertilizers and they underpin how we move around and how we interact and how we communicate. So in the transition towards a net zero or um, mission zero future, we need to be looking for alternatives to all of those things that at the moment fossil fuels does for society. And at the same time, we re need to reduce overall consumption as we heard in the debate um, just earlier this afternoon. So rural Wales and the land in rural Wales is rich in natural and cultural resources. And for me, I think that's the key to thinking about the future, is that as we, as we replace the things that at the moment rely on fossil fuels, we need to look to those resources to help provide some of the alternatives. And so my vision for land use in the future is, is very much about multiple use um, and multiple benefits. From, um, from the resource that we have uh, in the land in rural Wales. Making better use of those resources and also thinking about what we call waste and trying to minimize that, that, that perception by seeing those things that we throw away as things that we could reuse in different ways. So for me, land use change is not just about carbon sequestration. And we need to think about multiple land cover types in Wales going forward. Um, different types of land all have the potential to play a role both in carbon sequestration, in providing alternatives to fossil fuel resources, and in maintaining the connections, the really important connections between people in the land and nature. And I worry about those future scenarios that are terribly, um, what should we call it, um, removing that connection between people and nature and saying, let's just make space for nature and leave it, and, and that's the best thing we can do for everybody going forward. I, I absolutely agree that we need to reverse biodiversity decline, but I don't think the answer to doing that is to remove people from the picture. Um, we've been there a long time, and we need to understand that relationship a lot better um, going forward. So for me, trees can be part of the future solution, but they're by no means the main point. They won't on their own do a huge amount to um, redress our carbon challenges. Um, and they are actually about much more than carbon. You know, wood and trees have been part of traditional economies for a long time. They offer a future in different ways of using them, just as farmland does, just as all the other features in rural Wales do, our water resources, 
our landscape management and planning. Um, so really, I just wanted to make the point that for me, um, the land use debate is, is, is much more complicated and much more potentially diverse and perhaps exciting than some of the ways in which it's been portrayed in the media. Thanks. I'd like to welcome our second speaker, who is Abby Reader. She is a third generation farmer working on a family farm, 700 acres, and if I've done my research right, 200 milking cows, 150 sheep, and 60 beef cattle. Phew. Um, she's a graduate and postgraduate from the Royal Agricultural University. She is deputy president of the NFU in Wales and won award in 2019 as the winner of the Farmer Weekly Farming Champion Award, as well as having an MBE for services to farming. The most interesting thing I'm interested about in the bio is Abby is a co-founder of Cows on Tour, a voluntary initiative that visits schools to talk about the farming story. Maybe we'll hear a bit about that later. So over to Abby. Right, thank you very much for that introduction. I wasn't actually going to touch on Cows on Tour, but uh, perhaps I will now, given the context. Um, yeah, just to give you a little bit of background, I am a farmer. I farm literally down the road, about three miles as the crow flies in Wembo, uh, a mixed farm. Uh, you've more or less got the cattle numbers right. We're, we're touching about 500 cattle all told, so that would be the adults on the, uh, you know, right down to 24 hours old um, on the farm, 150 sheep. We've got some arable ground as well. In terms of what our farm looks like, just to help you understand it, um, our very best ground grows our crops because that's the most valuable thing you can grow. And if I could grow fruit and veg, I'd be growing that. Um, so our very best ground gets crops. Where we struggle then to get proper establishment, we'll put that down to grass, and that will be focused on our dairy cows, because they then provide the next valuable crop. Where we've got really poor ground, and I'm talking about ground where bedrock is maybe that far below the soil, and in some places it's about that far above the soil, um, that's where we'll keep sheep. Um, and sometimes as well, we'll be a little bit dictated by what is going on around the field that those animals are in. So we live on quite an urban farm. There will be a number of fields where we would never put livestock because we'd be too concerned about interactions with people, interactions with dogs, um, children with guns and various things coming out. So the interaction between the farming environment and the urban environment is very interesting. And perhaps that's where Cows on Tour came from. Cows on Tour was developed in this county, in Glamorgan, by a group of farmers who realized that actually we're becoming quite disconnected from people who live in urban environments. Um, and those people matter to us. They're, they're citizens that eat our food. Um, so we needed to try and put steps in place to, to try and make that connection. And help people recognize that we're not, you know, we're not these mythical people that, that live in huts. Um, we're quite advanced, we're quite an advanced industry. Um, we are entirely voluntary, we're self-funded, um, and we will go into schools, take, take over school for the whole day, we take along our livestock, our crops, any produce that we've got, our machinery, and we will talk to youngsters about food and farming and make sure that they can have a positive experience. Um, I'm also with NFU Cymru, so we've got the National Farmers Union here in Wales. Um, so we're representing over 7,000 farmers in Wales who would be our members. Um, and absolutely key for us is making sure that all farmers who are within our membership are productive, progressive, and profitable. That's, that's our overarching aim. But also sustainable and environmentally friendly and considering climate change. And that's how we're trying to shape any policy going forward. And it's important to note really that the food and drink industry in Wales is worth 8 billion. It's, it's bigger than transport and aerospace combined. And it is Wales's largest employer, um, employing quarter of a million people of which uh, nearly 60,000 of that quarter of a million are employed directly on farms. So we are a significant part of the Welsh economy. And, and Sometimes when you hear stories such as um, Port Talbot and the steelworks, when they're coming under stress and we talk about the jobs that are under threat, pales in significance when you actually look at farming and, and the amount of jobs that, that can impact. Um, where farmers come from, so we touch a little bit on rewilding, it'd be great to get some questions on that. The, issue, the key issue that we see with rewilding as farmers and as a farming community is if you go into a community and you take out one farm for rewilding, you take out that family, 
And then if you take out that family, uh, you take away the neighbors, the, the support, the emotional support, the labor support, um, you start to lose the doctor's surgeries, the village shop, the local pub. Um, before you know it, your rural businesses aren't getting the same amount of business, so they become a lot bigger and they move closer to urban areas, further away from you. So to us, it, it feels like a threat because it is destabilizing our community. Our community is absolutely everything. I was introduced as a third generation farmer. It doesn't matter what generation you are, but that's my history. And I'm third generation on both sides. So my mother's parents uh, had a very small, um, it was a market garden actually in Radha. Um, sadly now it's, it's being built on, it's, it's got a housing estate going on there, but the soil under there is absolutely incredible. It's grade, uh, grade two soil, never seen anything like it. It's, it's absolutely beautiful, silk in your hands. Um, and that's where they used to be able to grow the fruit and the veg. And they had the small milk round that would go around the village um, with a horse and cart every morning and, and give out the food to local people. And, and that's how they made their living. And I, I think we've heard earlier today about, you know, circular economies and things like that. For farmers, that's quite exciting. You know, the thought that you could actually maybe go back to being able to have a lot shorter routes to your market and to see the people that are actually enjoying the produce that you've got and to have faith that, you know, you may not be able to grow large volumes of, say, fruit or veg, but you could grow it and someone would buy it. But at the moment, we're looking at a very complex supply chain which doesn't support that sort of economy. And it's going to require a huge shift that it just almost seems beyond scale to imagine. Um, I think really those are the main points I want to cover. Probably just the, the final point to note is at NFU Cymru, we have got an ambition. We take climate change very seriously. We have got an ambition to be net zero by 2040. We're going to do that in three ways. Um, the first one, and it's the simplest, thing, simplest one for farmers to understand, is actually just to become more efficient. Um, so that would be to get more milk from my cows or more meat from my cows. And that doesn't mean making them work harder. It just means getting better at making sure that they're kept properly, you know, improving your knowledge, improving your care of them, improving the facilities. So, um, and the same then with grassland or crops, whatever. Just get better at what you do because if you can get more food, more kilos of food out of one meter squared or one acre or one hectare of land, then you are going to be better um, from a carbon footprint point of view. Our second one then is re use of renewables, better use of renewable energy. You, you'd struggle to find any farmer in Wales and indeed the UK who doesn't want to utilize on that, especially now with rising energy prices. It's really difficult to do. Even living three miles as a crow flies from here, um, we don't have a good enough grid connection to even be able to support our farming business. We'll blow the main fuse every, every six months without fail. Christmas Day morning, I cross my fingers when everybody's turning on the oven to cook their turkey because they're taking all that power, which means chances are I'm going to blow the main fuse on, on Christmas Day, which means that we'll have no power to milk the cows. Uh, we won't even have power to boil a kettle in the house. So uh, you go then further out into the sticks and the grid connection is even worse. And then you've got the road connection as well. So renewable is a really good opportunity, but still very complex. And then the third one is carbon sequestration. That one is the most unknown. I mean, that's our ability to pull the carbon out of the atmosphere and get it back into the soil. There are a number of trials going on throughout farms in the UK. My farm would be one of them. Um, it's, it's too much to go into now, but they're just trials at the minute, and there's still not enough information out there for a business to hang their hat on. And my final message um, to leave you with was, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be here for this morning, but I did manage to arrive at lunchtime, although you had all come in and, and started your session again. So I thought I'd have a little look at the lunch that was on the table, um, and I was trying to find local produce that was being eaten at lunchtime today, uh, and I couldn't find any. Well, I don't think I could. Potentially the carrots might have been British. don't know if they were Welsh. Uh, and potentially the flour in some of that pastry might have been British. I'm not entirely sure what else on that table out there was British or Welsh sourced. And I was looking at the chickpeas, and obviously chickpeas are in hummus. There is one commercial farm that I know of in the UK that can grow chickpeas, and that's in Norfolk. I certainly don't know of any in, in Wales. And it's not to say that I wouldn't want to start adapting to things like that, but Wales is a very unique climate, and there's only so many things we can do, and we need to think about that um, a little bit more going forward. What are our capabilities? And in some ways, it feels like you've almost decided, well, maybe not you guys, because you're here for a reason, but people have almost decided that there is no place 
for Welsh farmers because that meal says there isn't. And I'm here hopefully to try and convince you that there is and there are things that we can do and we are willing to talk to people, to pilot things, to go into schools, to give up our time, to give up our, you know, our resources, to try and help people connect with us because that's what we want to do. So thank you very much. Is that working okay? We took great care in ordering that vegan lunch and tried to use local suppliers as far as we possibly could. We were thinking about having Welsh wine later for the reception, but we decided not. Um, but we can talk about that later. Um, rather, I've got a whole series of questions, but um, I saw the last session and there were so many hands going up there, so I'd rather get questions from you. We've got Grace with a roving mic, and I think we'll repeat what we did last time. So have three questions in a row. So one on this side, a lady in the green, Grace. Let's go this side on the first to begin with, and then we'll move across. Hi, I'm um, Dr. Sarah Morrison, Learned Society of Wales, but I'm here speaking as a farmer's daughter. <laughs> um, one of the main challenges in agriculture in Wales is the succession issue and what happens next. And I wonder whether the panel have any thoughts on that, particularly in the light of the new payment structure coming in to support agriculture in Wales and the fact that it's not facilitating long-term planning for farming businesses and the challenges that could face. Hi, um, I'm Barbara from Size Wales, and it was a really interesting um, presentation. I just wanted us to zoom out a second and really think of land use at a global scale and to kind of follow on from Abby's point about supply chains. And we know that the climate crisis is a global issue and what we do here in Wales has global impacts. Um, at Size of Wales, we commissioned a report with WWF Cymru and RSBB Cymru, which looked at how the fact that we are importing about nine agricultural and forest commodities such as palm oil, soy that we use in um, animal feed, uh, coffee, cacao, paper timber pulp, and that's driving um, devastating deforestation in tropical areas. Those nine commodities use up 40% of the size of whales if we were to, to kind of replicate the same land. So those products that we're importing for food are having a massive land use impact globally. And I think there is this whole, we need to change the narrative and look at shorter supply chains. We are importing 55,000 tonnes of beef from places such as Brazil or importing 190,000 tonnes of soy to use in our animal feeds. So I think we have been working with NFU Cymru um, looking at a sustainable kind of feed program and looking at how we can eliminate the use of soy, for example. So I'd really like to ask the panel, what can we do to ensure that we're not just looking at land use here in, in Wales, but also land use globally and trying to shorten supply chains, but make sure that those, the way that we are producing food is ethical and sustainable. Uh, thank you. Um, so in this sort of big, knotty land use question, one of the big ones that is always in the front of my mind in this context of uh, decarbonised society, but also thinking about the other goals in the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act, like a globally responsible, resilient Wales, is how should Wales feed itself? Because that determines so much of our land use. Um, and I'd just love to hear your thoughts on what you think the sort of Welsh diet should be and how that relates to what's being farmed in Wales and how we're using and managing our lands. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for those three questions. So um, I think I'll take them in reverse order and take question three and question two together. So how should Wales field itself and also about land use on a, on a global scale? Okay, that's very interesting that you said it between what we eat in Wales and, and our land use, because actually at the moment there's not a very strong connection because we produce a lot of things which are exported and we import a lot of food. I say we, I don't live in Wales, but I mean, that's the situation in Wales. Um, I think um, 
Obviously, there's arguments in respect of agricultural land use to do with comparative advantage, and it is very clear that both historically and culturally, pastoral agricultural systems have helped to produce and maintain some of the biodiversity on which, you know, for which Wales is internationally renowned. And in the future, I think grazing management and grassland farming is still going to be an important part of Wales and what, what Welsh agriculture does. And there's a, a lot of reasons for that. You know, it's valuable culturally, it's valuable for biodiversity. It is an area of comparative advantage. But when you look at what people eat, you know, most people, I don't know the dietary figures for Wales, but for the UK as a whole, um, of the meat that we eat, three quarters of it is chicken or processed meat. The average family eats lamb six times a year. You know, um, lamb is a wonderful thing, and I, I eat it more often than that because I think it's both ethically produced um, in terms of the animal welfare. It's not pushing the system beyond its limits. It has a lot of positives in terms of sustainability, but it's not popular, and it's competing all the time in the market with chicken, which is very, very cheap, and yet chicken depends on this large-scale import of um, soy and other feed materials from outside the UK. So I completely agree with the point that you made about thinking about the global land use implications of the choices that we make locally. And one of the things that has happened with the relative, you might say, uh, the, the decoupling of agricultural support and the move towards more farmers responding to market signals has actually been a shift in Welsh agricultural production more into the production of poultry to meet the demands of um, the big sellers of, of poultry in the UK um, for, for producing more of their meat locally. But it's, it's local in terms of where the chicken's produced, but it's not local in terms of where all the ingredients that go into that system come from. And, you know, we now have a, an issue in Wales with nitrogen in water and the, the designation NBZ. You know, that's not the fault of the sheep farmers. That is to do with the way in which we've shifted our production systems and that we're now produ producing much more of this more intensively produced meat, which has... Um, consequences because of the so-called waste, which is actually very valuable nutrient, and how that's then going into the system. So, you know, I think th looking at the whole system, somebody said this morning, systems analysis is so, so important to trying under to understand how we move forward in a more sustainable way. Right, um, just touching lightly then on uh, the soya first, because I find this conversation absolutely fascinating, because it, it you know, communities overseas are exactly the same as communities right on my doorstep, as far as I'm concerned. Um, soya is a fantastic product when you put it into livestock to give you a return. There's, there's no doubt about that. So it's not a bad product. It's the deforestation that's bad. Yes. Um, I think that how we go about that really is, is linking into the end. Well, for me, it's linking into our three goals for net zero, and that would be onto the efficiency. If I can grow better grass, then I need less soya. And I know that if I have a good growing year, I don't need to buy in the extra bits and pieces. So therefore, you know, I can do better. So we're really lucky that we've got Ibis and Aberystwyth who do um, world research in grass varieties. We've got some huge challenges coming towards us now with, with probably more drought and hotter climates. So there's going to be lots of problems there. There's also, I, I touched on it earlier, but um, as part of the agroforestry trial on my farm, we're looking at a novel crop that potentially might replace soya. But you have to think, if you replace soya, um, it is a fantastic, very, very efficient crop. So if you take out an acre of soya that you're no longer going to buy from, I'm not sure you could just replace it with an acre of something else. It might end up being two acres of something else or three acres of something else. It might be less as well, we don't know. Um, even if you do that, will a cow or the, the sheep or the chicken want to eat it? Is it tasty? There are, there are a lot of sort of things in that pipeline. And then touching on to the Welsh diet, do you know, it's, it was a really good question because I hadn't really thought about it before until someone said to me the other day, you know, people can't just live on lamb for 99% of the time, can they? I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, and again, it goes back to this supply chain. I am open, very open to growing more diverse um, crops on my farm. The thing that we need to be aware of is I won't be able to grow it commercially. Um, I'm going to struggle to compete with, you know, big farms that are over in Norfolk that have that fantastic soil and climate and can grow it really well. I'm not going to be able to do that. And when we, when we fully appreciate that everybody is watching the pennies, 
how can they afford to buy the produce from me so that I can afford to grow it for them? Great. Thank you. There was the first question about succession oh. issue for farmers. Do you want to take that one as well? Yeah, I'll touch on succession quickly. It is the blight of the industry. Um, it, it, it's a problem on my farm. It's a problem on a lot of farms. It's, it's the ability for one generation to hand down to the next. And sometimes you can get the older generation hanging on until they're literally in the coffin um, before somebody can, can take over the business. And um, I suppose it's so complex because your business is designed to be passed on. And actually, when you look at a lot of businesses that are out there at the minute, they're not necessarily like that. Um, I think that we're seeing a lot more new entrants coming in, and actually over half of my workforce are made from people who have not come from a farming background, and I suspect more will be like that in the future. I also suspect potentially there will be more tenanted land in the future, which brings its own challenges, but that might, might help a little bit with the succession, but it, it's, we're never going to solve that one uh, overnight, and if you come from a farm, you know how painful it is. I'd like to say I, I was lucky enough to evaluate um, a couple of years ago the European, community, the European Union's um, succession policies as they're applied across different countries in Europe. And um, we found examples where um, if governments are really positive about the need to sustain the farming community and to invest in farming, and particularly in thinking about the need to transition towards much more sustainable methods and new techniques and all the you know, buzz around regen and different types of, of, of agricultural management, um, they put their money where their mouths are, basically. You know, if you live in France and you're under 35 and you've done your agricultural degree, you can get a capital grant to go with your business plan of, of sort of 70,000 euros to 100,000 euros. Um, it makes a big difference. It's not just the money. It's the whole process that goes along with it. It's the advice and support, and it's the commitment to the industry, which I think is, is you know, uh, it's not so visible here. And I, I commend Wales as being, you know, the, the region in the UK that did look seriously at, at some kind of support for young farmers to help with setup. But it's a huge nightmare. It's, it's, it's both the, the, the whole issue of, of capital investment, because most times, as you say, when you inherit the farm from the previous generation, things need to be done to improve the, the, pro the profitability and the, and the future prospects. So there is a role for investment, but there's also a lot of help needed in respect of the kind of the legal, the institutional, the kind of other paraphernalia of, of transferring a business from one generation to another, especially in a situation where, for example, the house might be you know, an issue. Where's the younger generation going to live while the older generation is still there? We don't, you know, we don't, it's, it's almost like the issue in hospitals with where do people move on when they stop working? I mean, they still want to be connected to the business, but there may not be the facilities there. So lots of institutional issues. And I know there's a, there's a wonderful woman I met at a, um, the Oxford Real Farming Conference who's a um, lawyer in Wales and does a lot of work on su succession. These are really important issues. But that's if you care enough, if governments care enough about sustaining farming, then they will put money and they will put effort into these things and they would get results. So I think this is about political will and it's about understanding that that relationship between people and land and the knowledge of how to manage it properly is an important asset that we shouldn't throw away. Great. Thank you very much for those three questions. I promised I would take questions on the right-hand side here and then we'll come back this way. So, um, gentleman there, right next to you, Grace, to begin with. Hi, uh, Dan Thorman from the CAS Centre at Cardiff University. Um, I wanted to ask... Feedback, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask about how you see the ability to reconcile some of the policy differences and polarisation surrounding that, around evidence that suggests that um, eating meat and dairy has higher carbon emissions and um, also in the agricultural community that maybe there's these issues of carbon sequestration which might have um, the ability to overcome them. Um, and specifically on the polarisation, how difficult it might be for Welsh farmers or British farmers to uh, say that we might need to eat less meat overall, but that local meat from Wales might be better. Um, even the conversation there about the kind of vegan lunch, I think that speaks volumes for promoting a lower carbon diet. Um, and it was kind of presented as something that was quite polarizing, that was neglecting something else when actually it's kind of highlighting the importance of um, a lower carbon diet. Thank you. 
Hello, hi, it's Patrick Cardi from Welsh Government. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel what they thought about the place for trees in this. We've talked a lot about um, sustainability and the import of food, but it's the same position with, with timber. You know, over 80% of our timber is imported. We're the second biggest importer in the world after China, and you're offshoring emissions and problems and all sorts there. Uh, we also need um, Welsh grown timber and a vibrant industry for our circular economy. And the, perhaps they're talking about this in the other, the other room about um, uh, you know, wood, the, the role of timber in construction, etc., helping deal with that sort of emission. Um, and the final thing, just referring back to that last point, talking about future generations, um, you know, is there a role for timber in actually helping secure that done the right way because it's producing a crop for the next generation, a very valuable crop when, it, crop when it's actually harvested? So I'd be interested to you know where the panel think we could grow trees. We've got enormous targets, lots of money available. Uh, what's the best way to do it? Or is it something we shouldn't do? Hi, my name's Tavy Murray. I'm actually a sea level scientist from Swansea University. So this may be a very naive question, so I apologize if it is. I'm interested in the panel's view in land use in a much broader sense. So we've concentrated a lot on food, um, but my um, understanding was that by sort of 2050, when we'll be in the next generation of farmers, we may need to be replacing oil that's used in um, plastics and so on through um, bio use, biofuels and so on. And I was just wondering what whales might look like then, how whales might help that transition and whether there's a view that that's got a role um, in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for those three excellent questions. Oh. Is that okay? Um, so we've got three questions there. Um, I'm particularly interested in the one on, on trees because Janet mentioned in her presentation that it, it's not just trees. So I'm really interested if it's not just trees. Um, what, what else can be done? What are, what are the wider options? So, should we start on that one on trees? Would that be okay? okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, what I meant by that was that it's not just about you know, planting up blocks of Sitka spruce to grow quickly to soak up lots of carbon. I think trees are going to be hugely valuable in the future, but it, it isn't about you know, huge, huge areas of coverage. It's about thinking about what trees can provide, and they have many different potential functions that can work really well in a mixed land use um, rural. Um, mosaic. So, you know, for, tr for me, um, I cut my teeth doing research on um, the value of the bocage and the hedged landscape for microclimate and for um, keeping the cycles of water and um, temperature, you know, sort of within bounds that make them more manageable. And I know that, that there's an awful lot of landscape infrastructure that's kind of degenerated because there's been no money in the management of it. There's been no incentive to do so, and farms have been pushed to get bigger and bigger, and so actually maintaining your infrastructure, by which I mean your hedges, your trees, your little copses, your bits and pieces that, that aren't producing food but are still part of the important, the, the important kind of um, value, asset value of your farm. You know, invest, reinvesting in that I think is really important because that will actually help us cope with the climate challenge in terms of adaptation. Um, it'll help preserve water, it'll help to create those microclimates that are more favorable for different types of production. You said you couldn't grow vegetables. It's interesting. I live in Gloucestershire and up on the Cotswold Brush in um, just north of Chipping Camden is a very successful local business of a number of people growing vegetables and selling locally. And it's, it's not really expensive. It's, it's a short supply chain system. And they've been established there for three generations, and it works. And it's only grade three land. It's not good. So you know, some of these things we have, we have to challenge. That there, are, there are different ways of doing things. But your point about, about timber and the materials that you can produce in woodlands is really important. Also, you know, the, the understory, the, the shrubs you can grow, the, the, the fungi, the other things. There are lots of things that woodlands can provide for us if they're in the right places and they, they work for the local community as well as the market conditions. So I think we will need more trees and woods going forward. We haven't got the mechanisms right. We've been offering grants for woodland planting for, for decades and they never achieve their targets. I think you need to unlock the multiple benefits from woodlands so that people are motivated to, to, to want them for lots of different reasons. So that means a little bit of investment in 
uh, wood-related supply chains, but it also means thinking more about the other roles that trees and woods in a landscape can play and pushing those benefits and, and supporting that through public policy as well. So, you know, I think they're certainly part of the picture. What I, what I meant was it's not going back to that, what happened in the 60s and, and before with all those blocks of, of Sitka going up everywhere, which then had no market value when they were, when they were grown. Great. Do you want to go Yep, well, I'll just come in really quickly on the, uh, on the veg. I can grow veg. It's commercially. And before Christmas, there was a report out that Sainsbury's was selling a bag of 20 carrots for 19 pence. Yeah. I can't grow that. Okay, my, my carrots would look like that or like that or something, and, and no one would buy them. So, you know, it's great. It's, it's all about that local supply chain. Um, right, so the trees... We could go on and on and on about it. I'll, I'll use the, the headliner in farming, which is the requirement for the proposal for the requirement for 10% of tree cover in order for farms to access farm support payments in the future and why that is so controversial with farmers. So we will be asked to take 10% of our land out of production and put it into trees, and we will be paid for it. I accept that. We'll be paid for it. Uh, on my own farm of 700 acres... Um, I've got about 40 acres of trees, so I would need to take out 30 acres uh, and put that under trees in order to be able to fit that scheme. Um, it wouldn't be economical, I don't think. I haven't had the figures yet, but it's unlikely to be economical. And, and the key reason is, yes, you would be paid for that area, but what you're asking me to do is reduce the size of my business. So a few cows would probably have to go because it's not the same land area. I wouldn't be able to get the same economies of scale for any anything that I buy in. Um, I may not be able to meet my contractual requirements um, for the people that I supply with milk. Um, I may have to reduce the hours of the number of people that I employ. And it's all that knock-on effect then that, that happens within the rural communities. And it's, it's not, it may not, but everybody's running scared. And that's where that tension is, is coming from. And, and perhaps, you know, if I was just going to tout it, and it is only my opinion, Perhaps if it went in for a lot simpler, let's just go for 2%, everyone, you're more likely to get a 90% uptake because it's not so frightening. And then look at seeing whether, if that works, let's upscale it. But trees, um, to me, uh, and again, I'll just refer very quickly to our agroforestry trial. Um, on my farm, it's very different. We're not just growing a tree. That tree will have a use. And uh, all the trees that we are planting will be harvested either every two, three, four, or five years. And they will go into various products, whether it's into um, building works as biochar, whether we feed it to cows, use it to reduce ammonia and slurry, whatever it is. It will provide an income on the farm, and that offers me stability rather than completely relying on a handout for doing nothing. Great. We had um, two more questions. One from a gentleman from Cast about the lower carbon diet, and the other one about oil and um, about use in plastics, etc. Do you have a response to either of those questions? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of a bit hesitant on, on the meat one because I have quite strange views, and I probably make somebody in the room upset, and I don't want to make them upset. But the point that I made about about diet, you know, I think it's clear at the at the very sort of the top level that. In societies like ours, people are consuming more meat than they need to for a number of reasons to do with, you know, we have the obesity issues, we have all of those sort of issues. But the thing that gets me is when people say white meat good, red meat bad, because I, to me, I, I actually think it's the other way around. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe not white meat bad, but certainly it's not the case that, you know, you're fine eating loads and loads of chicken, because we just talked about some of the reasons why chicken isn't as simple as it might look. And... The efficiency um, statistics that people talk about in respect of the climate emissions from different sectors, a lot of them are based on very generic figures that are based on s production systems that we don't have in this country for, for red meat. Um, and the thing is, you, you don't, I don't think pound for pound you eat as much red meat as you do white meat, even in the same meal, because it's more filling, it's more dense. And you don't eat, certainly in, if you look at the pattern of people's diets in this country, people eat much less red meat than they did a decade ago. They've actually halved their consumption of red meat, whereas the consumption of chicken has grown. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I, I myself eat less meat than the average, but I try to eat 
good quality meat, well produced in systems that I have confidence in. And that leads me towards eating more red meat than white meat. And it, look, it's a huge topic. Um, number one, people need to eat what suits them best. And that, that is such an individual choice. You know, it, it's not really for, for any of us to say. Um, if I was going, well, which I am, if I'm going to, to stand up for, for Welsh farming, then I think we should be really proud that we know and have proof, thanks to stats from Bangor University, that Welsh lamb, for example, is amongst the most sustainable system in the world. So if we accept that red meat and dairy is very important, is a very important part of nutrition within the diets, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just think about carbon. We need to think about the nutrition. And actually, you could go on and think as well about the socioeconomic. If we look at the um, uh, nutrition, then actually, in many ways, we could do a lot to help more sustainable systems around, around the globe to, to try and get them up to our level as well. And it's quite interesting because we do. We send genetics out to Africa. Um, I've been working recently with Swansea University um, on how they can get more efficient milk cooling out there to give a longer shelf life in, in um, sub-Saharan Africa and, and things like that. So we have a lot to offer as an industry. But it, it's a huge argument. Happy to have a chat with you afterwards. Clearly, I'm going to say that my cows are here to stay. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, I would, I would like to think that there's some cow's milk at the back of the room and there's a carton of, of, um, of a note alternative. And I will bet money that mine is more sustainable because of the socioeconomic and the nutrition um, and the carbon. Well, it's interesting, actually, that at least it's oat milk. Oat milk is probably yeah. the better of the, <laughs> the non-dairy alternatives. But, yeah, no, it's interesting. And, and milk is, is something which is hugely valuable but has been devalued by what, the way in which people drink it. So they're drinking white water rather than something that really tastes important. <laughs> but that's another point. I want to just pick the, the point up about this, precisely the point that you made about the need to use the land for a whole load of other things was the point that I was trying to make at the lecture, and I'm sorry if I didn't make it clearly enough. I think the future land use in Wales could be a lot more diverse. Um, because of that need to produce things in, um, that we currently rely on oil to supply. So um, I had a really interesting conversation with a researcher from SRUC last time it was a, at a conference about hemp and about the use of hemp in construction and how uh, much more sustainable it is than concrete as currently made. Um, and it, in a lot of ways now, money and time is being put into exploring some of these you know, alternatives to the fossil fuel-based um, economy that we've, we've developed. So I, I would in, imagine in future that we could envisage a land use pattern across Wales that would accommodate the use of land for construction materials, the use of land for um, chemicals in, in other sorts of industries, the use of land for medicinal uh, plants, the use of land for water regulation, the use of land for all the ecosystem Stuff you know, so I think all of those things lead you to thinking. Yes, we need we need probably a multiple range of different um, land cover for different purposes. Great. Let's open it up again for another round of questions. So, the gentleman there in the in the white blazer, and then oh, there's also a man um, who spoke in the earlier session. So we'll take those two. Uh, the lady on the right hand side next, and then we'll move across there. We've got until four o'clock, so I think we've got time to get everyone's questions in. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, thanks. So Nick Miller, and um, I'm an organic farmer as well as a consultant. Um, I'm, I'm just interested really in the point you make, Abby, about we can't grow vegetables um, in Wales, but it seems to me that we can't do dairy in Wales either if we have to import substantial quantities of soya and cereal from outside. So should we be aiming our support at farming that can operate a closed loop system in Wales. And I'm thinking perhaps of Ireland shifting to a grass-based dairy sector, and I'm, you know, we could debate how successful that was. But it seems to me that a lot of our problems arise from the fact that we don't have a circular system. We're importing a lot of stuff into the system, and that's creating a lot of the issues we have around pollution. And it seems to go very much against the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in terms of being a globally responsible Wales for us to support farmers to carry out those practices. Now, I, I totally accept there's an economic imperative and that kind of the way farms have evolved over time, that's the system we have. But I think one of the problems I have in a sense is that 
I see farming as a massive opportunity to create really excellent practice. But I don't think until we all fess up and say we have a problem and this is how we're going to help to solve it, that we're ever going to get there. And at the moment, I feel the farming sector is totally in denial and saying, no, no, we're doing everything really well, it's brilliant, and it really isn't. Clive Ormsley from Natural Resources Wales. Uh, we've talked about farming, we've talked about food and forestry. Um, we've touched on ecosystems and so on, but in, and somebody's mentioned that we need to take a systems approach. So my question really is around the kind of the, we've talked about the climate emergency in the conference as a whole, but we need to integrate our thinking along with the biodiversity crisis. And I just want to ask the panel, what, how do you view the, how can we accommodate the uh, response to biodiversity crisis within uh, future land management? And particularly, there's the, uh, the, the target for 30 by 30, so that's 30% of land being, uh, pr having protected status uh, by 2030. I'd be interested to hear your response to that. Hi, uh, Izzy from Community Energy Wales. I just wanted to touch on the point that Abby made about renewables and grid constraints. Um, because from working with communities across Wales trying to implement renewable projects, I know that the grid is a massive issue. But I was wondering how farmers are still decarbonising their energy um, with these constraints or whether it is something that is making a lot of farmers not be able to do that sort of work. Great. Uh, there's a gentleman in the front row in the blue jumper who's determined to get the fourth question in, so um, let's go for that. Thank you. I'm Ken Barker from Wales Green Party. Is there a case for Wales government doing more to support and uh, um, regulate, if you like, the, uh, the food chain uh, supply and uh, bring more skills into the workforce and is there a role for local authorities to uh, do more in terms of uh, their development plans? Thanks. We're getting really good questions, aren't we? And um, so let's keep plodding our way through them. I always think it might be easier to do it in reverse order, but I really like the first question from Nick, which seemed to be about one of the three Ps um, that we heard about in Abby's presentation to begin with, about how pro progressive farmers are. So let's, let's start with there about the problems of importing lots into the system and how that allies with the Future Generation Act. Yeah, great question. So I had um, two fantastic stats the other day. One is, well, actually, is quite a few stats. Well, anyway, we're only about 15%, if that, self-sufficient in fruit and veg in the UK. That's, that actually shocks me. Um, I also heard that if we were going to become self-sufficient in Wales for veg, I don't know if that included fruit, so let's just go with veg, um, we would only need to shift 3% of farmland in Wales to veg. That is fantastic. But the most exciting bit to me, which links into so many other questions out there, is that could provide up to 40% more employment in rural communities. Now, that is really, really exciting. So what does that mean? Um, and perhaps it almost links into this, this last question on, on supply chain, because this is the absolute key. The market will drive everything. Um, you know, there used to be a farmer about a mile from me who grew cauliflowers for a supermarket. And I think only about 30% of those, 30 of those cauliflowers were ever fit to go into the supermarket, and the rest of them used to be chopped up and ploughed back in because they didn't fit the certain stats. So it's the supply chain that's a problem, and it's not, it's not trying to pass on blame. I mean, this is where we are. I just don't know quite how you pull it around. And that would then come into um, the issues with the supply chain and should and could the government do anything to regulate it. So within NFU, one of the particular pieces of work we've been working on for the last six years, and it's been painful, is trying to get regulation on contracts for dairy producers with their, with their processes. Um, because there are some very unscrupulous people out there. Um, I can give you some horrendous examples where um, farmers will have a contract that says even if you die, you have to continue supplying us with milk, otherwise you'll be fined. Um, I have contracts where, well, the last contract I signed, my previous processor went bust, uh, owing me a lot of money, which nearly 
drove us out of business. Uh, but I was left without a contract, which is the worst place you could possibly be in the world when you've got milk that is coming every day, twice a day. Um, so the next contract I signed said you were not entitled to legal advice, uh, and the processor stood over me while I had 20 minutes to read that contract when I don't understand the legal terms and then sign it, because if I didn't sign it, I'd be completely stuffed and there'd be nowhere for my milk to go. There are all sorts of very strange and very, very unfair terms out there. Uh, we saw during COVID, milk processors have the ability to do retrospective price change. So what that means is you go into a shop and buy it, a can of Coke for a pound. You go up to the counter and you give that person a pound and you take your Coke away and they call you back at the door and say, actually, I'm now going to charge you uh, £1.40 for your Coke because I can. Uh, and that's what's happening in, in the dairy industry. People are buying our milk and then coming back and saying, well, I'm not going to give you your 38 pence now. I'm just going to give you 30 pence. And if you go out of business, that's your problem because there's plenty of other people out there. So... All of that links into this question. And, and to end on a positive for that, with the three Ps of productive, pro progressive, and profitable, with support from Woodland Trust, because Nigel sat there, uh, and Sidder Agroforestry, um, we are putting in polytunnels at my farm to look at trying to do that. Because if it can't work on my farm, which is just on the road, it's not going to work anywhere. But it scares the living daylights out of me because it requires capital investment. I have no idea how to grow the veg. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I sell direct to people. I sell to a, a big corporate and my, my food leaves the farm in a big lorry and I never see it again. So there are lots of things around it that, that need to happen and, and there's a lot of work to do. But great questions, both of them. I, mean, I, I just wanted to bring up the issue of nutrients and how we view them and how we treat them. So I think if you did a kind of a nutrient budget for Wales, what we've seen in the last decade is an increase in the level of nutrients uh, going through the system. And that's been what's creating the problem now with NVZ. So you said, you know, we, we should recognize that farming has a problem. Farming has problems, quite a lot of problems. The other one, one of those is the, is the supply chain issue that Abby described as well. There's, there's quite a lot of problems and challenges. And the whole uncertainty surrounding what policies are going to succeed um, the old cap in all four of the parts of the UK is, a, is another big problem because it's creating uncertainty and it's making it very difficult for people to invest because they don't really know what the future direction will be because it's not yet clear. And uh, so I think there are lots of reasons why farming is in, in, in a particularly difficult place at the moment. So I, I don't think anybody's being complacent about the future. Um, I think um, the circular economy is a really important thing to hold on to here because at the moment a lot of the nutrient that's going through farming is is going to waste and it's causing damage on the way but actually that's valuable to put back into the system and it's also valuable as a potential source of um, energy as a potential source of other kinds of products um, so we need to get you know we need to get much better at thinking about that whole process um, because why should we be buying in fertilizer from systems that use huge amounts of fossil fuels to sequester nitrogen from the air into a, into a product when there's huge amounts of nitrogen going out of the system in, at the other end? Um, so I think, I think more circular economy thinking. And there is um, an appetite in the industry now, which is growing with the current crisis, with fuel prices having gone up, into looking at, at being more circular in the way in which nutrients flow through, through the system. Um, the supply chain issues are, are real and are really very serious. And um, the UK government, I think, has been very slow to act on the inequalities in the system. In the Agriculture Bill in England, there was um, a paragraph put in there about trying to address supply chain issues and ensuring more fair bargaining uh, up and down supply chains. I haven't seen a great deal of activity on that front, but at least the power exists. I hope something similar exists in Wales. I would have thought it does. Um, you know, when you have a lot of small suppliers and a very, very few people at the top controlling those sectors, you know, that's a natural tendency is that the power will concentrate in those few people at the top. So their role and their responsibility is really important and they need to be much more engaged in some of these debates and being very transparent about standards and responsibilities and fair treatment. Um, so I think that's another problem to be addressed. Yeah.
second question I think was about the balancing between sort of biodiversity targets and carbon targets and that the 30% target was mentioned. Do you have a view on, on that question? I mean, I think, I think probably Wales already has 30% of its land protected in some way or other. We have a lot of SSSIs and SACs and such like. Um, I think um, the biodiversity crisis is important and urgent and people um, need to give attention to it. The UK is a country where the land has by and large been managed for millennia and our biodiversity has co-evolved with that management by people. Not necessarily the current management, but the traditional systems of management have helped to establish the biodiversity that we now enjoy. It might be possible to completely change our biodiversity, bringing in things that, died, you know, that were it, it made extinct a long time ago. There are experiments going on in that way, but we also need to maintain what we've got that is distinctive, unique, and special. And that, by and large, depends upon continued management by people, but in relatively extensive or in more, uh, what do we call it, alternative, regenerative, organic sorts of systems. Um, understanding that relationship between management and biodiversity, I think, is really important to addressing the biodiversity issues in the UK. Um, it might not be the same in every other country of the world, but I think that is important. Couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> Pointless going through the panel um, to get another answer. So, um, I think the, the only question we haven't really touched on was a question about renewables and what are farmers trying to do to, to decarbonise. And there's one about whether the Welsh government and local authorities should do more. <laughs> okay, so on, on the renewables, um, different farms in different areas will do different things. We've got a lot of farms who are in the uplands who are able to make use of hydro, and there are some fantastic examples out there of that. Um, there's also quite a lot of poultry producers that are doing some fantastic things with either solar and or um, biodigesters. Um, then you get farms like mine, which will be doing various little bits and pieces. So we'll do heat recovery on the milk. So take the heat out of the milk to use it to heat the water, and um, you can do a heat exchange on, on milk cooling and things like that. So there's, there's little bits and pieces that you can do, and very much the market will dictate it. So solar wasn't really attractive a year ago, but now it is. Um, and again, I think once you can get better grid connections, um, I think that would help. There'd be things as well, such as you can get either single phase or three phase electricity. Lots of farms are still single phase, could really do with going three phase, but it will cost a lot of money to change all of their electric wiring over. Um, so support for that is quite handy, support for transformers, etc. So, yeah, there's, there's some really good examples out there, but um, there's still a long way to go. Do you want to answer the ultimate question? And the final question of the session is that what can Welsh Government and what can local government do? Yeah, no, I, I think um, local government has done some quite useful things in putting some of the building blocks in place to think about shorter food supply chains. And more could be done on that front, but it does need uh, a longer-term commitment rather than just uh, short-term trying bits and pieces. For one thing, for example, putting people in contact with each other, putting potential producers in contact with potential users or buyers or distributors, processes um, at a small scale could be valuable work for local authorities to do. Um, Welsh Government, yeah, I mean, um, Natural Resources Wales could be a force for good, um, but it needs a lot of investment and it needs a vision um, that is stronger than has yet emerged from the bringing together of the Environment Agency and the um, uh, uh, C CCW, wasn't it, and the Forestry Commission, um, because we've all made points about the importance of integration here and about taking a view about, about um, how you bring these things together in a sensible way at the local level. So um, a good, strong government agency with a vision for thinking in a systems way and integrating the, the different needs that we have from the land is important, but they need to work very much in close partnership with local communities um, 
and to evolve a way of working which is not just painting them as the regulator but seeing them as people who are actually trying to trying to bring people together and trying to negotiate um, better solutions. Um, you know, the, the classic cliche in sustainability stuff is about think globally, act locally, but, you know, it really does matter in these debates about future land use and about how we, how we meet all our future demands in a way which is, is um, meaningful and will last. You need the local people and the local communities to be on board with your planning. They need, they need not to feel that decisions are being made a long way away from them. Um, so I think a bit more investment in, in enabling some of the Welsh Government's key institutions to work closely with local communities to build that joint endeavour. The thing that Jane was talking about earlier, about this sort of shared vision for the future, it would be really important. Um, yeah, there's probably lots of other things too. <laughs> so that just leaves me just to um, conclude the panel, really. Um, so I've learned a lot, and I hope you have too. So I've learned about the three actions that farmers are trying to, to change, so become more efficient, use of renewables, trials on carbon, etc. We've learned about soya. I've learned about hemp in construction. I need to learn more about that. I've got no idea. I've learned about how often lamb is eaten. I've learned about the soil in Wenvo and in Radha. Um, so there's all sorts of conversations that we can pick up from this. Um, I just hope you find it useful. And I'll put your hands together for Abby and Janet, please. So the final session is going to start at quarter past. You've got time to grab some water and then Dr. Rowan Williams will kick off at quarter past the hour. Thank you very much.
Can we all uh, take our seats, please, ready for the start of the keynote address? Okay, pranam da pao, good afternoon everyone, and a very warm welcome, Kroisa Mao, to this final session of the event today. I know it's one that you've all been waiting for, um, eagerly, our keynote address from our very distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Rowan Williams. My name is Rachel Ashworth, I'm the Dean at Cardiff Business School, Cardiff University, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here chairing this session this afternoon. Um, I think it was Steve Martin who, earlier this morning, those of you here set us our task for the day, which was to think about how we can provoke and promote public political po policy debate on uh, decarbonisation, and also think about how we can inform and develop longer-term strategic thinking so we can make the best policy choices for Wales. And I think, I think we've done pretty well today in, in getting that going and having those important conversations. And I, I'm sure you'll agree that the day has been a significant success in terms of bringing us all together for that. We've obviously been focused on the challenges um, of decarbonisation, and I think we've been talking about those in relation to other challenges, cost of living crisis, but also those persistent sort of inequities and inequalities that we're dealing with in Wales, in our communities, workplace, economy, etc. And I think, you know, one of the themes coming through was around um, holistic thinking across those challenges. That is something that was coming through in all the conversations. And I think that is our challenge really to take away, certainly is for me, operationally, strategically, how can we align all these efforts that are happening across decarbonisation, equality and diversity, workforce planning, um, fair work, and bring them together in a way that will deliver a just transition in the road to decarbonisation. So all of that, I think, leads us nicely onto our keynote speaker. Um, Dr. Rowan Williams. So we're really delighted to be able to welcome uh, you to the event today, Dr. Williams. Um, you are a familiar figure, I know too many of us, but just a little bit of background. Dr. Williams was born in Swansea before moving to Cambridge where he studied theology ahead of undertaking research in Russian religious thought at Oxford. He's published many insightful books and articles and papers on theology, literature and current affairs. Uh, during and since that time. He became the Bishop of Monmouth, then the Archbishop of Wales, spent a decade as Archbishop of Canterbury between 2002 and 2012. He spent a period as Chancellor of University of South Wales and as Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge, during which time he proactively campaigned for commitments to net zero. Dr. Williams is currently a little bit busy as co-chair for the Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales, just a small task for you to address there. And so we're very grateful that he's been able to spend the day with us and he's going to contribute to this final session. So Dr. Williams is gonna speak for around half an hour and then uh, we'll take some questions. He does have to leave sharply at five o'clock, so we're under a little bit of, of time pressure there, but we hope to get some questions in at the end. So please give your very warmest welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Rowan Williams. Well, pronoun darpau, a diolch o galon am gwahoddiad i ymuno o chi heddiw. Diolch o fawr i'r ganolfan. Thank you very much, Helen, and the Centre for the Invitation, Jack, and all others who've been involved in organising today. During the day, somebody asked me in what capacity I'd been invited to address this meeting. And I'm not quite sure what the answer is, because it feels rather like incapacity after listening to such a varied, suggestive, and challenging set of presentations during the day. 
and I realize also that I'm standing between you and your drinks reception and that thoughts may be just a little bit distracted. But bear with me, I shall try to draw together a few things that I've heard during the day and relate them to what I think is the wider vision we need in order to make decarbonization a reality. So I'd like to address very broadly four things that seem to me to have been coming up during the day on a fairly regular basis. The first is the question of definitions. Definitions of issues like growth or prosperity or indeed green jobs. The second is the very complex question of the global context in which we're thinking about decarbonization in Wales. A context we've been reminded of from time to time when people have asked how we extend what we say about business and practice in Wales in the context of a set of global pressures and agencies which frankly limit our choices. The third, and I would say very important theme, which I hope people will carry away from today, is the deep connection between the agenda we're talking about, the apparently fairly focused agenda of decarbonization, and the much wider question, and here I put on my hat as co-chair of the Constitutional Commission, the wider question of democratization. And that leads me on to a final point, which perhaps hasn't recurred quite so much in the discussion, but has very emphatically been an undertone or an undertow in a lot of it. And that is the kind of social vision which prompts us to think about and work for a decarbonized future. So let's begin with some of those issues around definition. A few years ago, my friend and colleague Tim Jackson of the University of Surrey established the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity based at the University of Surrey. And one of the discussions I remember with Tim and with other colleagues early on in the lifetime of that center was what we meant by prosperity. And somebody pointed out that the roots of the word had a little bit to do with looking forward and looking hopefully forward. And it may help us at times to think of prosperity not as something that can simply be measured in terms of what we presently have or control, but in terms of our confidence in the future. In which case, the issue of prosperity and the search for prosperity is intrinsic to thinking about the agenda of decarbonization. Because it seems to me that at the heart of what we've been talking about today is whether or not we and our children and grandchildren are going to be living in a context where they are able corporately to look forward with confidence rather than, as so often at present, to look forward with deep apprehension and confusion and frequently with denial. So perhaps we can think through a little bit what we might want to mean by prosperity when we use that term. And that immediately connects, of course, with the very intriguing and, I think, helpful discussion we had about growth earlier on today in a session which I, I found very stimulating indeed. More than one speaker noted that what was called the, the linear account of growth, that is a steady cumulative movement to more and more material resource, allowing us more and more consumer choice, was looking at best pretty stale and at worst rather toxic. And yet that remains the measure which most people instinctively reach for, which our media and our politicians still instinctively reach for. How do we move away from a model of growth which is both very vague and very narrow? Vague in the sense that nobody ever explains exactly what we're supposed to be growing towards. Narrow in the sense that the only measures that seem to work here are measures about 
consumption and choice. And I'll come back to that a bit later. But it made me ask myself the question of what is it that makes growth an attractive proposition to people? Why does the word sound good? And why is it that when we want to challenge it, we still echo it and talk about degrowth? I mean, shrinkage certainly is never something people are going to vote for in large numbers. But degrowth is still a sort of uncomfortable word which suggests we're still wedded in some way to the idea of growth. Well, in the organic world, of course, growth is something we see as good because it increases an organism's capacity to respond flexibly and viably to an environment. And I just wonder whether one of the definitions of growth we ought to be suggesting to move the discourse on is some notion of growth as a kind of constructive adaptability, that what we need to be growing is that ability to respond more aptly, more effectively, and more sustainably to the environment that we're in. And that's a very different model from what is called the, the linear model of simple acquisition. It's a process of learning. And growth in learning, in spite of what an awful lot of educational philosophy tries to tell us these days, is not just cumulative. So I begin with those issues of definition at what may be a level of abstraction that's uncomfortable, because I think the issues we're looking at are certainly to do with our corporate imagination, our political and moral imagination, not just our technical and political capacity. And to go on asking when we hear these nostrums, what exactly do you mean by prosperity? What exactly do you mean by growth? And what for? Is part of the task we should be setting ourselves. And I just feed into that discussion those two possible ways of thinking about those words. Prosperity as the ability to look forward with confidence. Growth as a movement towards greater and more sustainable adaptability, a process, an ongoing process of real learning. And it's worth saying, just as a final footnote to that first set of remarks, that very often what we're up against in terms of what resists processes like decarbonization and the movement towards a more just settlement, what we're up against is equally an imaginative model, but an imaginative model which increasingly feels like the phenomenon of addiction. The facts are there. The effects are visible. And the process continues. To break addiction needs a whole range of skills, a whole range of resources, and the one thing we mustn't do in confronting the reality of addiction, addiction to this narrow and toxic notion of growth, the one thing we mustn't do is just collude with what feeds the addictive process. So on to my second broad set of points, the global context. One slogan that I like to repeat from time to time, and I make no apology for repeating it yet again, is that the global crisis of our times don't read maps any more than they read party political propaganda. Just as a virus doesn't much mind whether it's a Chinese person or a Fijian or a Kenyan whom it infects, so the crisis of our environment doesn't much mind, whether it's capitalists, communists, Muslims, Christians, or whatever, whose livelihood and future it threatens. And one of the sad paradoxes of our age is that at the very moment when the pattern of global crisis becomes more and more familiar to us, we seem to be losing our grip on our ability to construct and maintain effective cross-national 
responses to crisis. We do our best, but it's an age when a particularly virulent and exclusivist nationalism seems to be pulling so many societies back into their shells at a time when we need concerted, coherent responses. So that is sadly part of the global context in which we find ourselves. And as emerged in the question and response in this morning's first session, the presence and the power of large-scale multinational business limits the choices that any national economy is able to make. That's a fact we have to factor in to our thinking. And how we get round it is not easy to imagine without thinking through the patterns of power and sovereignty and cooperation in the world of modern nation states. So to think about decarbonisation in Wales is inevitably to have to think about the patterns of cooperative power, of shared sovereignty in our world. And to remember that while we can't solve those overnight and certainly can't solve them in Cardiff or Holyhead, nonetheless, they are there as part of the agenda we are bound to confront. Our livelihoods are bound up with each other across the globe. And our lives are bound up with each other. We may try to deny it. We may try to construct, in international terms, the equivalent of gated communities. But just as gated communities do not solve the problems of social division and inequality within a society, so gated national communities are a failure. To work for livelihood, security, and sustainability in this, our context here in Wales, has to involve attention to the livelihoods of the entire family of nations, because the crises do not read maps. The great deal here which needs far more expert and far more detailed exposition than I can begin to offer in this short survey. But it's already pointing towards a point I shall come back to at a bit more length in a moment, which is the way in which questions of power and privilege are bound up in our thinking about these issues. And while we're on that question of global patterns of economic life, global patterns of exploitation of our environment, we really have to keep in mind, and we were reminded forcefully of this this afternoon, we have to keep in mind the way in which our practice of investment has worked and is still working. And I was very glad to hear so clear a statement of the complete moral and practical nonsense of an investment regime which consistently privileges stakeholder profit above everything else. Curiously enough, there are quite a lot of people in the business world who already see that point. And I was very taken um, at a meeting some years ago with a small group of people from CBI and other settings, when going round the table, only one person out of about 15 said that they regarded profit as the decisive motive in the business that they were involved in. And yet, all those businessmen, and they were mostly men, around the table were caught in a legal regime and a cultural regime which privileged and solidified that approach. How we tackle that, I'm by no means sure that it must be tackled seems to me very clear. Because, as another questioner from the floor reminded us um, in another session, we are in fact preserving in law and culture a regime which might have made sense in the very early days of capitalism and makes no sense now as capitalism begins to implode in various ways upon itself. 
So that issue around investment is part of the, the global context that we're looking at. And we have to bear in mind that our agenda and our goals in this small country as regards decarbonization have to be simultaneously ambitious and realistic. I know that's an unhelpful paradox, and yet I make no apology. It needs to be, the goals need to be ambitious because decisions have to be taken that affect the life and death of the people among whom we live, the people we are. Realistic because ambitious goals that lack realism end up demotivating, demoralizing people who are disappointed that results don't come as quickly as they ought to. And I hope another of the things that people will take away from today is the huge range of small scale but measurably effective policies and programs going forward in this country designed to make the kind of difference that will last. Very often when I speak to groups in and out of the church about ecological matters, something I find quite important to say is that you are not bound to make all the difference, but you are bound to make the difference you can make. And that's a principle which I think Wales and its government can very well have in focus in thinking about its future. And having mentioned Wales and its government, on to my third set of reflections about decarbonization and democratization. I've been very struck at how often during the day that theme has returned. As if there's a recognition that what you might broadly call a conserving attitude to our environment is also something to do with a conserving approach to human beings and their communities. We were reminded of what was called the intergenerational trauma this morning of the disappearance of heavy industry from large tracts of Southeast Wales in the decades, the last decades of the last century. And that that was allowed to happen without hope, provision, attention to local communities, without the factoring in of human cost, shows exactly why it's important to think of the conservation of environment and the conservation of human environment and resource as bound up together. But of course, it's not quite as simple as that. Because, as we all know, thanks to the culture we're in and the politics we tolerate, it's all too easy to represent green initiatives as some kind of insult to the freedoms and common sense of ordinary people, those elusive folk who can so often be appealed to by those who want to do something they know isn't particularly sensible. So part of the decarbonization program is surely the consistent and deep engagement with the population of this country, which draws out the nature of prosperity and growth more clearly. And that requires not top-down prescription, but persistent and imaginative grassroots engagement. We've heard about citizens' assemblies. We know something of their effectiveness. We know that opinions and possibilities change for people when there is that kind of engagement, when people are given permission to ask the supposedly silly questions, and when people are allowed and encouraged to have a wider, more durable perspective than their day-to-day -day habits always give them. And that requires, I think, from politicians and educators, a level of humility and patience the willingness to go and do the hard work at the communal coal face, do the persuasion and do the vision building. At the end of the day, 
a decarbonized economy which did not at the same time give us a more realistic and a more sustainable picture of how human beings make decisions together would be a waste of time. And as I've already suggested, a significant part of the decarbonizing agenda is recognizing just how undemocratic so much of our practice is. We were hearing in one of the sessions this afternoon about the vulnerability of dairy producers to almost unimaginably inhuman and unjust contracts. We've heard about the ways in which decisions about the use of land and the use of resources in general consistently override local concerns, local possibilities. In other words, what stands in the way of decarbonization is very often the habit of bypassing local democracy. And we've been reminded again more than once today of the need for joining up our thinking on so many issues. And I would say that joining up those two things, decarbonization and democratization, is very near the center of what our business is in the light of what we've been hearing and discussing during the day. And I would just add another note here, perhaps relevant to one of the sessions we've had today. People appeal to the possibility of technological solutions in the near or not so near future. I understand where that optimism comes from. We have quite an impressive track record as a civilization in the last couple of hundred years of solving problems by often unexpected technological innovation. But it is worth remembering that technology does not invariably work with the grain of democracy and the technology in its development is not resource neutral. So before we become too messianic about the unimaginable delights that technological development has ahead of us, let's simply register those two facts and be prepared to ask a few potentially awkward questions about over-reliance on technological solutions, as if once again we were simply in a straight line where technological progress more and more moved steadily forward, solving problems airily, day after day, week after week, and year after year, without ever, God forbid, creating new ones. So just a word of caution there. And then, finally, because this is been pushing through all I've been saying so far, what about the social vision that animates our search for a decarbonized economy? Once again, going back to conversations that I've had with, particularly with younger people, about the ecological crisis, I've often found it's important to say we're not involved in this just to solve a problem. We're involved in it because there is something that is intrinsically valuable for human beings about living in harmony rather than tension with one another and their environment. There is something here about where life rather than death is to be found. Obviously, as a religious person, I have strong views on the preferability of life to death. I hope that's shared by non-religious people too. But what I mean is there are ways of human living which surely are more sustainably, once again, in accord with the kind of world we're in and the kind of beings we are. The work we do is to honor that picture of what human beings can be with one another and with their global and material environment. It is better to understand that you are a finite being living in a limited world rather than to live in the heady fantasy that the world is a supermarket of packaged goods 
which you can accumulate to your heart's content in infinite succession. Because the latter is stupid and untrue. And it doesn't take a huge amount of rocket science or philosophical acumen to think that living out something that is stupid and untrue is less desirable than living realistically. And God forbid that we should use the word realism, as we so often do, as an excuse for doing nothing or as an excuse for reducing our ambition for our human world. So we need that sense of value, a word that came through once again in some sessions today, a sense of certain forms of life, certain ways of relating to our environment, certain understandings of our humanity, a sense that those things are of worth and durability and solidity in themselves. That's where the energy ultimately comes from, not simply problem solving, but attempting to go right back to the beginning of what I was saying, attempting to create an environment in which looking forward with confidence is the air we breathe, the atmosphere we live, enabling us to pass on to those future generations we've heard so much about today, a sense of being human and humane with one another and our world that will keep alive what we most treasure. I'm sure it sounds very odd um, to hear a Christian bishop talking about the central value of humanism, but I do mean here humanism with a rather small h rather than a large one. The humanism that is indeed realistic about the kind of beings we are and treasures the kind of beings we are. Not magicians, not brains in vats, not consumers, not ingenious exploiters of the world we're in, but humans, capable, again, see previous remarks, capable of learning, of growing, of adjusting creatively to where we are, growing into that capacity to adjust creatively to our world. So much of what we are used to and what we tolerate in our own society and worldwide pushes against that vision, that deep honesty. I think one of the things which we have to say in campaigning effectively, sustainably, for a decarbonized economy is that we are trying to get to a position where we are more honest as human beings about the sort of beings we are and the sort of world we're in. And if, as no doubt some people believe or act as if they believe, if there are those who say what's so very special about honesty or truthfulness, the answer once again is that it boils down finally to life or death. We've inherited a pattern which is in some ways more and more visibly, tangibly toxic for our humanity. Like any addict, we are very slow to recognize the toxicity of what we are injecting ourselves with. We need an imaginative revolution. And we need, of course, a leadership that will not be afraid of articulating these things. Somebody mentioned this morning that leadership was among the soft skills that needed to be developed. And I think that is very much to the point here. Those soft skills, those humane skills that allow us to see ourselves more honestly and more fully, do include leadership in its proper sense, which is not top-down, directive, impatient harassment. But the framing of a program and a final vision within which people can feel at home and for which, therefore, they feel they can work. So thank you very much for bearing with these uh, reflections on today's business. I've learned enormously from what I've heard, and I've been most grateful for that. And I would say in conclusion that what this has felt like for me has been a welcome exercise precisely in honesty, in truth-telling, 
And I hope that the work that we do, the work that our government, our representatives will do for this program of decarbonisation will be for all of us an exercise in learning and growing in honesty and in truth. And that needs courage, needs vision, and happily, there's been quite a bit of that in evidence today. And I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Jochen Varian, um, I'm sure you found that captivating and thought-provoking as, as I did. So we've got a couple of minutes. We are tight for time, but a couple of minutes if we could take maybe three comments and then I'll ask Dr. Williams to give a final reflection. We have one down here at the front. That, yeah, thank you very much. How do you approach conversations with climate change deniers who actually say, actually, it's getting warmer, and that's a great thing. It was, uh, how do you approach conversations with climate change deniers? Yeah. Yeah. Conversations with the climate change deniers. Primarily, I'd say, listen not to me, but to the people on the front line. The most effective communication I've heard in international bodies, one of the most effective sources of communication in the COP uh, summits has been from people, for example, from the Pacific Islands, who say, let me show you some photographs. That was the island as it was 20 years ago, with houses along the seafront. Here's the second slide. All those houses are underwater, and the village has moved up the hill. But the hill has a top to it, from which you can't move further. I want people to say, listen to that, look at that. Thank you. Uh, if I understood you correctly, I heard pleas for increased solidarity at multiple levels, whether global solidarity, whether what should have been solidarity with the old coal fields of the South Wales Valleys. And I wonder, from your experience, when you became head of the Anglican Church worldwide, it was a difficult time for the church. Do you have lessons you could share with us about how you engender that kind of solidarity? Thank you. I'm very glad you pick up the word which matters enormously to me. And two things, I suppose, come to mind here. One is, in certain circumstances, solidarity is most effectively showed by the willingness to share risks. So sometimes standing alongside someone. It's something I, I suppose I learned a bit of in South Africa back in the 80s, where I briefly worked with the church there for a couple of months. And I remember somebody saying, it's not that we as you know, white people can solve anything, but we can at least stand alongside others and take the risks with them. That, that was one thing. So the second is not wholly un unconnected with that. You build up solidarity by a willingness to, and that connects with the first question, to listen at first hand directly to the people who are directly most involved. You build human relations. You create, um, I've seen this in practice, you create, let's say, an email link between a primary school in Newport and a primary school in the West Bank or a primary school in Kenya. You have children emailing and that builds something. That's how you start. Final? One here. One here. First of all, thank you for such a great end to a, a really brilliant day. That, that, that was an incredibly moving and thought-provoking um, keynote speech. So, so you said in, in it, uh, you know, in terms of the redefining redefi prosperity and growth, you talked about growth um, being um, the sustained rapid adapting, but what exactly do we mean by growth and what for? But also, I want to add, is it also be, be who for? Who are we doing this for? And in terms of both human and non-human, um, in terms of growth, and, and, and I suppose as part of this process, how do we start to change that narrative? What is the way that we individually, collectively can do to start to change that narrative? Thank you. Um, who for is exactly the right question, I'd say, and that, that's where the what for ends up. So, well, um, nothing very novel to say about that. We start, I think, trying to model in whatever local ways we can 
a concern for what will be safe for the next generation. We start to model the kinds of solidarity that we've been talking about. And sometimes that means taking some risks by going out and demonstrating alongside others too, dare I say. And we, we work from there. We let ourselves be, be taught by the next generation a bit. What, what do they want from us? Listen hard. Something may happen. Something may break through. Okay, I think we are about, about at time, um, and it's time to close on what I agree has been a brilliant, a brilliant day. A reminder that drinks will be served just outside if we want to continue those conversations, so please do stay and have a, have a drink on your way home. We have a series of thank yous. Thank you to all the participants today, those of you here in the room, those of you watching on YouTube for your engagement. Thank you also to all the workshop chairs and all the speakers today for your efforts. And thanks to all the staff at the Temple of Peace and all our tech crew also for, for looking after everything and looking after us so well. Finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Wales Centre for Public Policy, um, firstly for producing such a brilliant set of reports that will provoke uh, and promote public debate around decarbonisation but also thank you for organising today and bringing everybody together to have these important and stimulating conversations. There's a whole team that has worked hard on today, but there is one member of that team whom today was his idea. Um, he proposed it and he has supported and encouraged and, and worked towards it. And he's been thwarted at various points by industrial action and all sorts of events and not least having a four-month-old baby as well to, to manage alongside it. So we would like to give a very special thank you and mention to Jack Price for his work in organising today. Thank you. So it just remains for me to say, thank you all very much. Shionai Viogel Adra, safe journey home, and if we can finish by giving Dr. Williams a final round of applause for his contribution.